Go officially ahead. be in the public session. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So the first item of business is approval of the minutes. And again, I want to compliment uh, Leon. They're very extensive. Uh, and I wonder if anyone has any comments or revisions to them. No. Looks like you did a great job, Leon. No, uh, mm -hmm. no modifications. So can I have someone move approval of the minutes and a seconder? I could move approval, George. George, OK, yeah, a seconder. Looks like Bridget's dying to second. Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, the views of the, of the day agenda, we've sort of gone through that. Are, are there any declarations of conflict of interest from anyone? Yes, Claude here speaking. Claude, yeah. Yes, for 3C. 3C, okay. I was originally with uh, Bruce Corvara on, on that project years ago. Okay. All right, anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. So you'll have to recuse yourself for that, uh, Claude. Uh, so back to you, Chris. Uh, I believe you have some slides you want to share with us on uh, last month's uh, projects. Um, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Do you have the slideshow there, uh, Leon? I do. I can share my computer. Yeah. Give me one second here. Where did you send them to me? Is it easier if I if I do it? I, I sent them to you as well. Um, but I already have it on here if you can see my screen. Okay. So I can just I can just control it while you are while you're okay. speaking. Yeah. Okay. So just to give a quick COVID-19 update for everybody. Um, as you know, the province has been curtailing construction. Um, activity and we have uh, concluded that three of our projects fit within the categories of essential workspaces and those include Portland's flood protection and enabling infrastructure. Uh, it's an infrastructure project and it's also a roads and it's also a bridges project so those all appear to be covered um, as essential. We're also continuing with the Cherry Street stormwater treatment facility and pumping station since that is a piece of infrastructure and the Bayside phase two streets and services, which are necessary to service um, condominium buildings that are already uh, well advanced and will be occupied soon. And some of them already are occupied. So um, those I think all met the criteria. There are several that we have decided to uh, defer. The first one on the list is the Bonnie Castle public realm, which we are revisiting because they're, um, there may actually be a, a rationale for uh, finishing that off because what's not done is the tree planting and we have giant safety boxes and security fencing around the tree pits, which are a bit of a uh, potential public safety issue if they're just left like that for a long period of time. So we may redo that one. Um, but the others uh, I think are, are off for now, which is the waterfront reconnect. I think you all saw we did a a painting project under the gardener at Reese, and we were about to embark on a few more of those, but um, those are now being uh, deferred. The Lakeshore Boulevard pilot project, uh, which was the Lakeshore Boulevard public realm with the permeable pavers. Um, the East Bayfront in-water pipe, which you guys saw with the boardwalk, um, and the, uh, the Bentway, um, and not the next phase of the Bentway, but actually some finishing up work. So there was a slope that um, washed away in a storm and we're not going to repair that right now. And there was additional uh, Corten cladding to go on the Pat Cow Pavilion and we're not going to proceed with that right now either. Um, and then our office continues to be technically open, but everyone is told to work from home. Uh, some people go in because we're doing the construction. We're not uh, in full lockdown. So we do have some people showing up at the office, but it is basically uh, shut down. And I um, can't remember what our latest extension date is, but I think we matched whatever the province did. So we expect to be closed until, I guess, that point in May. And then we'll we'll evaluate before then as to whether we reopen or we continue to stay uh, stay closed. 
but you know the organization is uh, doing a really good job, I would say, of continuing. All our work continues that uh, is allowed to continue. So we're all still really busy and all just working remotely. I spend probably six hours a day on uh, video conference calls, looking at different projects and looking at work. And um, you know things are probably moving a little slower. I know the construction of the river valley is a little bit slower, um, but um, but basically, we, life goes on here. So I think it's really a good news story. And George Zagarek has been a very good uh, leader in getting us to work remotely, but keeping everyone focused. So, um, so far, so good. OK, next slide. Um, so we saw the uh, Metrolinx uh, underpasses. Um, we've given them our comments. We are. Um, coordinating design input with the city um, since the city uh, this is a, you know, a city city asset the space under here um, we do um, have follow-up coordination meetings um, and we're trying to coordinate with their pedestrian the PCCS which is their pedestrian connectivity or maybe it's pedestrian and cycling connectivity study um, and hopefully we'll get that to uh, to come to the DRP in the summer how did they take our comments on handrails and things like that um you know, I haven't actually been in a debrief with them. Have you, Leon? I didn't hear a lot of blowback, though. So, um... no, I, I haven't. But I, I think they're they're trying to coordinate a meeting to really go through them again. So my sense is uh, cautiously optimistic that they're going to try to respond. Good. That's great. Probably not to everything, but you know. Okay, Leon. Next one. Okay. Uh, Ireland Park Foundation building. Um, so they are planning to bring the public realm back, which I think is what the panel asked for. I think there were less concerns around the building, but lots of concerns around the public realm. And they are going to be retaining a landscape architect um, who will work on this. So hopefully we'll have a, a more kind of resolved and and like compelling uh, landscape approach uh, next time around. Okay, next slide. Uh, one Young, the corner open space. Um, I think we are uh, in a good place because city staff, by and large, agreed with everything that you guys had to say about the problems with the design. Um, and the city is uh, going to work closely with them to try to resolve the design issues. And I think James Brack, who's on this call, is actually involved in that. James, I don't know if you have anything that you want to add at this point or not. No, actually, and, and Deanne, Deanne is on the call as well. Uh, and and I, I actually, I'm not involved in this one because- Oh, I thought you were, I'm about. sorry. My mistake. You're the tall tower guy. I thought this was your thing. No, I have a conflict on this one. Oh, okay. All right. Um, Deanne, is there anything do you feel you need to add? Um, no, except for that we agreed with panel and we're trying to take those comments forward and in align with where you guys are going. So we'll, we'll hopefully find some changes. We're happy to hear that. We appreciate it. It's not easy, but uh, okay. Um, next one, Leon. So. Um, well, I'm not going to read all of this, but you know we um, we presented to you last time the technical evaluation uh, recap that was given to the public. Um, I think that was useful. Work continues on this. Um, our board has extended the uh, deadline for um, the plan development agreement um, done largely in response to COVID-19 and the slowdown done. on the work. Um, there'll be a uh, June 25th now vote uh, by our board on whether or not we've kind of passed the next series of thresholds and are ready to move into um, working out a uh, agreement that we could sign by the end of the year. So um, there are still some issues that haven't been figured out, but the negotiations continue. So June 25th, look for that board vote. And then I think we're still targeting December, though, given that um, 
the May date moved to June, the December date will probably move to February or something, I suspect, but I, I don't know. Um, we're also going to extend our deadline for public consultation survey. Um, and we have given notice that our human rights impact assessment is going to be delayed until mid-May, but we are still going to continue that. So uh, Keyside continues. They won't be coming back to DRP until all of the terms of the agreement are figured out. And then we have to still go through, a, you know, an actual design review process with with uh, with the projects. And we haven't figured out exactly what that'll look like, but it will probably be um, another look at the master plan. But then I think each of the elements will come back to the panel. Um, like the first two buildings, because I think they're planning to do blocks one and two first. So we'd probably go through a traditional review of those building designs and do the same thing with uh, Parliament Plaza. Chris, uh, so just a question. Uh, would that likely take place not till the end of this year? What's your estimated timeline for that? Uh, the end of this year or even next year? Oh, okay. So I Chris, think, uh, I mean, if. I guess it will depend on exactly where we are on June 25th, um, but they may start actually preparing their documents, if which case we'll go through design then. But if they hold off until the actual um, uh, development agreement is signed between us, then they may not really get into that until uh, until the new year. So and I don't know yet what they're planning, and I'm not sure they've decided yet either. So, Chris, I heard that. Um that they're looking for, actively looking for a development partner, uh, somebody with much more experience uh, in the Toronto Basin to uh, to actually build the buildings with them. Yep. Uh, and that you're participating in that discussion. Uh, yep. I think that's extremely good news for this this panel. So do you want to tell us anything about that? Well, I don't know very much, except the, the, uh, the terms of this deal have actually always been that they needed to have a development partner. We never, the RFP under which we selected them never actually said they would be the developers. They were going to be the innovation and funding partner. So they were going to really set out parameters for the development and then um, find a developer to deliver it, deliver the project, uh, incorporating all of those parameters. So that's still the plan. And, um, you know, we've done developer proposal calls before, so we will be working very closely with them on doing this developer proposal call. And that yeah. hasn't started yet, but um, I think uh, they're going to start looking pretty soon. So I guess if all goes well on June, they might start that process more more formally to find someone. I think they're supposed to try and have someone by the time we sign the contract, but I could be wrong about that. I'd have to talk to Meg. Um, but yeah, that was always the idea, and that that is how it's going to happen. So there will be a developer with uh, with experience, and it's worth the sharing with this committee. Yep, yep. Okay, um, Leon, do we have anything else? Oh yeah, okay. So just some construction photos on Portland's flood protection. The uh, the lake filling for the Cherry Street Lake filling is almost done. Uh, and the uh, cutoff walls for the river valley, which is the caisson wall that that bounds the actual river mouth on each side, are uh, are still in progress. So it has slowed down because they have reduced crews now. I think um, on on the project because of COVID, but they are still working. And some of the habitat work is wrapping up. On the right, you see a picture of the uh, one of the coves. Um, it's actually looking pretty good. Okay, next slide. Next slide. And there's Pat's beautiful um, pumping station building with the roof on it and the framed out window openings um, coming along. It's looking very cool. And Chris, yes. Um, sorry, some of, some of my staff were asking me about this building because I think it's a little bit of a mystery for many people. So yeah. it's a a pumping station for. So I can small. I can sound smart in front of them when I tell them. Oh, right. it's it's well. There's a stormwater management system for the West Donlands that is also now going to uh, serve uh, East Bayfront, and so this building has the um, UV treatment for the water and also. Uh, um, I believe the pumps that enable the water to get, uh, sorry, not the UV treatment, the um, sediment, the, the ballasted flocculation system is in here to get the 
the sediments out and then it pumps this pumps the uh, desedimented water to the UV treatment uh, facility in Sherburne Common. Am I right about that, Pat? You can answer this question better than me, probably. Yeah, well, there's, there's UV in the building as well. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah, I guess we added some UV capacity to the building. That's right. Yeah. And then it goes back out into the shaft and then goes directly, I believe, directly into the lake, into Keating Channel. Oh. Well, thank you. It's, a, it's pretty cool. And it's a it's the top of the most massive tunnel chamber structure I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. And it's been a long, torturous process for Pat, but she's hung in there. So, yes, this is this started in two thousand and ten. Um, oh my God! Everybody remembers. Um, so we have actually uh, any comments after the meeting would be welcome. So we've got. From, from this vantage point, the concrete looks not so bad. The bottom right photo gives a bit of a better sense of what it's like. The uh, the board form joints are quite pronounced, which is sort of surprising because we used a really high quality DOPA system for uh, for all of the forming. There's been a lot of discoloration in the concrete, and then there's a lot of um, you know just issues with. Um, not, but concrete's not great. It's a process. Of, um, uh, we're, we're recommending sandblasting. Um, uh, sort of a thinking of a sort of medium to dense uh, sandblast for the entire structure, uh, which I think will even everything out. It'll kind of um, take the concrete from looking like cast in place to a little bit more. You know, when, when, with the sandblast, sort of, sort of like a, a, you know, a, an Indiana limestone. I don't know if anybody's got any comments about it or any experience with sandblasting, blasting concrete. I know it's commonly done as a kind of cleaning method and to get rid of sort of loose uh, concrete. But any comments, be welcome. All right, you're all invited to give Pat some advice, which. Um, if anybody needs to jump in now, please do. If not, um, give Pat a call. But I'm very proud of it. I feel like uh, despite some of the concrete issues, it's really um, it's really turned out quite wonderfully. So um, nice, nicely done, Pat. OK, next slide. Um, I think you all know about the destination art piece that we're doing in Sherburne Common. Um, we did decide to actually issue our RFP despite COVID, um, and um, as a as a step to hopefully ensuring participation, we actually called um, all of the galleries who represent all of the artists that we were hoping might participate, just to give them a heads up and let them know this was happening. And they all thought that there would be an interest and uh, willingness to um, to bid despite COVID. Um, so we will see. We'll see what kind of response we get. Hopefully we get a lot of great response and we can move ahead. Um, if COVID turns out to be a real um, stumbling block, we may have to rethink our procurement strategy on this. But uh, so far, we're moving ahead. Just from the, Chris, just from the inside, the uh, what we've seen is a big drop in RFP, RFQ uh, lately. It's starting to pick up. So I would say that anything someone like Waterfront Toronto, anyone who can put stuff out there right now, I think is uh, being very welcome by, the, by the, uh, the community. Yeah, well, that was kind of the uh, intel we got, and that's why we proceeded with it. So um, hopefully it pans out. OK, next slide. And we have a full agenda so far for next month. The uh, PIC Corps, which is the uh, sort of film district in the Portlands, is apparently ready to come to have their urban design guidelines reviewed. Um, 11 Bay Street, which is the little conference center building right across Bay Street from our office. Uh, there's a proposal for that. Um, West Onlands Block 347 may be ready to come back. 55 Lakeshore, um, which is uh, the... Um, that is the rest of the LCBO site, correct, Leon? Am I? Yes. Yeah, and the then the rest of the Lakeshore Boulevard public realm um, schematic design. And then we have one item on the wait list, too. So we will probably have four, if not five, items uh, next month. Okay. 
I think that's it for me. And I think I've run over schedule because I see all the proponent team members waiting here for uh, the first item. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, we're just about right on time. So um, uh, I guess uh, Josh uh, Herbert, is, is he available planner for Waterfront Toronto to make the introduction? I am. I'm right here. Okay. Hi, Josh. Hi, how are you guys? We all ready Good. to go? I am, yes. I just got to share my screen here. Okay. Is that up and being shared yet? It sure is. Yep. Excellent. Is now exiting. So we're ready to go? Yep. I'll dive right in. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I'm Josh Hilbert, a development planner here at Waterfront Toronto. And welcome to the first item on today's DRP agenda. Uh, 3C's PL1 site located at 324 Perry Street. Proponent is 3C Lakeshore Inc. The design team is Adamson Associates, PMA Architects and Zero Footprint. And we're here for what we're calling uh, the schematic design number two for this project. As it's a private development site, the proponent technically completed their DRP scope with their first schematic design presentation in November of 2019, at which they received conditional support. But they're aiming for full support and they requested a turn, return to the panel to show that they've addressed some of the outstanding items from the last DRP presentation. So for some site context, here's the PL1 site in white located at the northwest of the larger 3C lands, which are outlined here in black and bordered to the north by the Gardner Expressway. Lakeshore Boulevard East to both the north and the east of the site, Keating Channel to the south and the silo site is immediately to the west. There are three transit routes that are accessible to the site, two bus routes, the 72B Commissioners and the 121 Cherry Beach Bus. Um, also the 504A King Streetcar, which currently terminates at the Cherry Street Loop next to the distillery district, just to the northeast of this. Then on the project background, dating back to 2011, between 2011 and 2012, the 3C Waterfront Master Plan was prepared. Between 2012 and 2017, that uh, time encompassed a very extended LPAT process, which resulted in a mediated settlement and produced the area specific official plan and zoning bylaw amendments, which now apply to these lands. And since 2018, we've seen the preparation for and the start to construction of the new Cherry Street alignment through the 3C site. And a bit on the history of the applications and panel visits for these for this site. In 2016, uh, in December of 2016, there was a site plan, plan a subdivision rather application that was submitted for the entire 3C lands um, and a relatively recent submission of which is currently remains under review with city staff. In May of 2019, there was a pre-app consultation with the city and waterfront Toronto for this PL1 site plan application. In July of 2019, the proposal was first presented to this panel for issues ID and in October, a site plan um, site plan application was submitted to the city, which currently remains under review. In November, schematic design was first presented to this panel. And now here we are in April 2020, and we're seeing the second schematic design being presented and a formal site plan resubmission, resubmission to the city is anticipated shortly hereafter. And a little bit on the proposal itself, it's the first site plan application for the three C lands since the zoning was settled through the LPAT mediation process. The proposal remains very similar to what was presented to this panel in November, consisting of an 11 story office building with retail at grade and now approximately 19,000 square meters of total GFA, three with three levels of underground parking. And future applications to permit uh, the development will include minor variants and consent approvals at the committee, uh, as well as an application to remove the holding symbol. So this drawing, is taken from the Gardner East Public Realm Study, which represents some of the emerging policy to keep in mind during your review. It received direction from City Council through the Gardner East <clears throat> and Lakeshore Boulevard East Reconfiguration EA. And the study was presented to this panel a year ago in April of 2019. It proposes a number of public realm improvements to Lakeshore Boulevard East, including moving the Martin Goodman Trail from Lakeshore south to Queens Key, once that extension to Queens Key is constructed through the 3C lands. 
creating a new public trail on the north side of Lakeshore Boulevard East, and the introduction of a planting zone on the south side of Lakeshore Boulevard with trees planted in permeable pavers between granite curbs and expanded sidewalks, which will interface with the northern boundary of the PL1 site outlined here in pink, in the bottom right corner. And Waterfront Toronto, the city and the proponent have also just begun discussions on the form of the new Trinity Street, which runs uh, north-south along the western edge of the site. And we're, we'll continue working through right-of-way widths, the amount of that right-of-way to be provided for automobile traffic, pedestrians, cycling, and street planting as well. And this slide just illustrates where we are in the review and approvals process. Again, the first schematic design was in November of 2019, and we're now here for the schematic design number two review. And this is a recap from uh, uh, some of the summarized uh, consensus comments from the panel in response to the first schematic design presentation in November. The panel mentioned the importance of considering the greater site at this stage of design to maximize development, loading and parking and public realm potential. However, you were not supportive of a future service road from Lakeshore into phase two and urged the team to consider some alternative solutions to that. With regard to the building itself, uh, the panel asked for more details on the retail spaces, including programming strategy and layout and access issues to consider leveraging the ground floor passageway to create more uh, pass through and capture the terminus views along Queens Key East. You supported the overall facade, facade design strategy, but asked the team to consider some further refinement on resolving the exterior details, including more information on the fenestration details. And Finally, to consider stainless steel as an alternative material to the anodized aluminum for the exterior, exterior cladding uh, and the potential introduction of color. With regard to landscape, uh, the panel asked the proponent to consider delivering the plaza pop space as part of the phase one development and to provide additional outdoor amenity for tenants on day one. You felt the temporary design feels a little bit cluttered and to focus on a single strategy to create a high impact program and opportunities. To consider how the temporary phase one landscape will connect with future phase two development, provide more information on the building landscape design uh, and to consider winter performance opportunities. As a pioneering site, the public realm is critical that it be a success from day one and to please address that uh, and to incorporate the final streetscape patterns and designs of Queens Key and Lakeshore Boulevard into the landscape design in order, to, uh, in order to anticipate the future connection. And finally, for sustainability, the proponent was encouraged to push the project to meet its TGS tier two. And I will now hand off briefly to Colin Wolf from Community Planning, and he'll address some of the city's issues uh, for panel consideration. Morning, everyone. I'm Colin. I'm, I'm the planner on the file at the City of Toronto. Um, just as we discussed last time on this file, there's there's a draft plan of subdivision and an LPAT settlement that are in force for the site. We know that there's a wider precinct plan, and this is the, the first uh, development within that plan. So we want to make sure that the spirit of that is is honored and respected going through the process. Uh, there's some flood protection considerations and their impacts on grading is something we're turning our minds to. Uh, impact uh, and interface with public streets is going to be important. We know that Lakeshore and Queens Key East, the design work is ongoing, associated with the alignment and average grade. So that's something that's still being determined. And as Josh mentioned earlier, the design for Trinity Street is something we're workshopping with several applicants in the area. So the design functionality and the alignment with EAs are still something that are under review. There's an interim alignment of the Martin Goodman Trail as well, and how that works with easement and maintenance operations for the gardener is something we're looking at as well as future proofing the ground plane in, in the context of phasing because we know this is the first building and the changing surrounding conditions and finally we're strongly encouraging the project to to pursue the green standard uh, uh, tier two we know they're close and that's something we're going to continue to work with, with them for thanks thanks Colin. And finally, Waterfront Toronto's areas uh, for panel consideration. Focusing on the building, do the ground floor changes address previous panel concerns, including capturing the vista along Queens Key East, addressing the future plaza on the east side of the building, uh, as well as um, addressing the concerns with regard to the triangular retail space at grade. 
And further, does the added design detail adequately respond to concerns regarding the facade cladding pattern and materiality? And with regard to landscape, do the temporary landscape design revisions adequately address the panel concerns, including is it its ability to function as a day one pioneer site, providing for a flexible outdoor amenity space, concerns regarding the revised design of the roof and rooftop elements, as well as updates to the landscape, and finally, the building's outdoor terrace landscape uh, and planting details. So that wraps up the intro. The proponent team can now begin their presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is Greg Dunn uh, available? I'm, I am online. Dunn? Can you hear me? And can you see me? Um, not that I'm really the main event. Um, and now I have one more thing which to do, which is to share my screen. Uh, hang on here. Do you see my screen now? Uh, yes, yep. we do. We've Excellent. Got it. All right. Well, th thus ends the technical part of my presentation. <laughs> I'm very happy to have got through that part. Okay. Great, great uh, job. Great job. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, I want to uh, I want to emphasize something that was said in the public um, forum. Um, I just personally want to thank uh, the panel and and certainly um, Waterfront Toronto for um, carrying on uh, in these times because. Um, the last thing anyone needs is more more reason to put uh, work on on pause or hold and 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 I, it's critical to the industry that you guys are doing what you're doing. So thank you very much for that. Um, for the uh, the setup, this is our our second sort of schematic presentation. Um, we have, uh, as we did last time, structured it in three parts: architecture, public realm, and sustainability. Um, but we have learned that we have to be very wise with our time. So we're going to clip through and we have really focused on specific responses to the issues that the panel raised and not just providing an overview of the design. Um, so that's the structure of the presentation. I will move through these slides with some clip. Josh also gave you the overview on the site. They're actually there more if we need to come back to them on the context. Um, some aerial photos uh of the site which is right there um and this image shows our building in the overall 3c development um uh, but of course we are the first building to proceed on this uh in this development and likely uh could proceed even some of the adjacent sites so we have uh presented a lot of the work here in and um uh, and thought fair bit about the building in a day one condition, what we call the pioneer condition. Right. Um, there we go. Uh, the, um, the basic party for our project, um, as we moved around, we, we, we talked early on about precast and, 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 and riffing on the silos and the, and the gardener, we moved away into a sort of more, a more modern uh, machine, uh, and that's where we've settled. Uh, so we like the idea of a, of a new machine in the Portlands, um, but one with the sort of embedded natural element. So that's our project party uh, and uh, a render. And as Josh says, not dramatically different in massing and um, concept than what you've already seen. I'm not going to take the time to read this because this is where we've fallen down on time in the past, um, but we have isolated the same sorts of issues you guys already have and um, um, talked about how we're going to respond to them or how we've responded to them. Most loudly and clearly, and I think it was two to th two or three of the issues that were uh, right off the, the top, is that the panel had uh, felt that we hadn't really leveraged the sort of unique condition of this inflection point and, and the, I would call it a partial view terminus, not a total view terminus, of Queen's Key. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about this pass-through lobby, whether it was a good thing or bad thing, where it went to and, and, and how prominent it was uh, as a feature. What you're going to see is we amped up our response. We stepped back uh, and really, really felt the problem was about the corner and how we were addressing it. Um, and we've amped up our response there to create sort of like a funnel effect, um, both to, 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 to really uh, highlight that this is a gateway into our development, but also um, give more of a, uh, a, an address and a, and a, a good view at the, um, at the terminus. Um, the 
Lobby is still a pass-through lobby. We used to have sort of an entrance off of Queen's Key and, and a retail unit here. We've now actually gone full force right for the for, for a, a pass-through right from the corner. So we've got the pass-through lobby. The other thing that had been talked about at length was in, in, in the notes was the, the triangular retail unit at the front. Um, we are now considering that part of the lobby. It'll be part of the controlled aesthetic of all of this space. So basically from Queen's Key, you'll be able to see in right through to our core wall. Uh, but we still hope to use this as an animated element um, with sort of a cof uh, coffee bar or something that uh, um, is both an amenity for our tenant, but also creates some street life. Um, we also have the retail units, a uh, smaller one right at the entrance, and then the one at Trinity and Lakeshore, and one facing onto our passageway between this and the plaza uh, and the other development. Um, I'm going to show you some axonometrics, uh, again, just sort of to help you understand um, both the scale and, 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 and the changes here. Um, so this is that pass through ele element. Now, also reorienting it, I think, uh, has helped a lot because it used to sort of hit the corner of the plaza. Now it strikes right into the middle of the plaza. Um, there's this notion of this, this retail unit that's uh, often activating the lobby, but part of it. Um, you're now up into our first floor, but you can see the scale. That's the second um, and, well, the third floor. But th this is a three-story feature here at the entrance, a portico. Um, and this is also where we start our first spiraling terrace. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the uh, bigger office floor plates that accesses directly onto the terrace. In the lobby, we have a, a green wall. Um, we uh, just want to emphasize it's not just a notional green wall. Um, we've done a bit of work with a, a, a and, and engaged a green wall consultant, um, and we're going to uh, leverage sort of this idea that that the, the the green is is actually on the sort of metal cable um, tension metal cable, uh, and so we get this verticality to the element. Um, uh, which which then completes um, our idea that the green sort of spirals down in the building right down to the lobby level. Um, this this image does show the concept of uh, uh, of the scale of this feature now starting to address the inflection point in Queens Key and and um, also set us up we think for this narrative of the green as it rises up through the building. So it's much more in the scale. This is just looking around as we sort of swing around. So this would be from, I guess, the south uh, west corner of Queen's Key and Trinity. Um, uh, this is the scale at the entrance, the triple height feature and the verticality of those uh, uh, green wall elements. This is moving around to the side. And one thing that you, again, um, uh, can be a little bit harder to pick up, but they, they, you're seeing right through the retail unit, right through to the passageway, right through the course. There's a lot of transparency, a lot of activity right onto Queen's Key. Uh, you're also seeing that stepped terrace starting to ramp up in this image. Um, and again, this idea of activating it, but, but this is all controlled. I think this is another point to be made. This is not a, a stock retail unit that's going to go wherever it goes. This is controlled architecture uh, designed and built with our lobby. For the, uh, uh, for the curtain wall, we actually haven't really moved very far, um, we, and we, we, which I consider a good thing because usually the pressure is to sort of increase glass and, 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 and or refine um, things sort of downwards, um, especially material depths and, and things like that. But we haven't been, we haven't been uh, under pressure to do that. And so we've been keeping this strong modularity. This produces a great sort of um, decrease because we're just under 50%, I think, um, solid to, uh, to glass uh, around the building. Uh, this is the same sort of modularity. Um, I'm going to get to the materiality in a sec, but this is the same sort of modularity again and dimensionality that we had shown. So it's for us, it was always important to keep this depth so that we had this very strong machined and punched aesthetic. We were asked to provide a bit more detail on the wall. I mean, we really just want to make sure that we we achieve this monolithic uh, effect um, and and equally that we um, have this sort of this sort of depth. One thing uh, that that sprung as as I was going over these recently is I do not even believe our energy model is picking up the substantial sort of shading impact that we and benefit that we're going to get out of these sort of uh, uh, pronounced depth uh, elements. So I think we're only going to be to the good on the energy model. And you can also see the zones that we start to achieve for um, vertical and horizontal uh, 
spandrel installation. We are uh, sticking with and and still feel our best um, fit for our sort of machined aesthetic is the anodized aluminum. Um, we, I, I've done um, uh, projects with stainless. It, 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 it's got a bit more of a, a granularity and this, this has a bit more of an abstract feel to it. The samples or the examples we're gonna show you are precedent projects that have the anodized. This was always one of our precedents. We've shown this one to you in the past, um, as was this one. Uh, these are both uh, with the anodized. Uh, and just to show you the firm's particular experience, and this is actually my experience, it's a building we did in London. Now, granted, this is with KPF as design architects, but it was detailed by Adamson. Um, uh, and this this just shows you the crispness and the consistency of finish you can get with anodized aluminum. Uh, and quite frankly, one of the things I think we really like about it is is the way it can catch sort of the sunlight and glow a little bit. Um, no, no doubt stainless does that as well, but we think uh, anodized is quite effective for what we're doing and achieves what we're after. Um, these are just, uh, it's always hard to render materiality, but this, these are just some, some images picking up both the sort of green against the, the, the metal. Um, and of course, the, I think we've shown this already, the overall building wide image. Um, from the gardener from the north, that was one of the things that's come up a couple of times. We just still uh, are working on with this, this sort of... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a more subtle uh, massing on the north um, and a little bit more abstract, um, but has the same basic uh, uh, wall elements. Uh, we talked about the need to activate the north. We have a big retail unit right at the corner in the arrival of Trinity and Lakeshore, uh, which um, we think helps really activate that northern facade. Um, and, and actually, there's another retail unit on the, uh, on the other corner as well. Uh, and of course, addressing the plaza has always been critical. We have great terraces that overlook it, um, and uh, it's always been sort of part of in how we engage and, and in some ways step back from and defer to the plaza. Uh, there's really not the time in this kind of presentation to go through the technical drawings, but we were asked to make sure that we, we work through um, materiality and elevation at grade carefully. Uh, modulation um, um, and there is there is a very high degree of uh, transparency on uh, basically four or four facades but for a short stretch on the north to update the panel on something that really wasn't uh, focused on by the panel but but it came up through the spa process is that we had this sort of stepped feature which again was sort of leveraging our idea of the the, the stepping terraces um, in the roof uh, in the roof element as it was drawn through with the city and the SBA, um, there was unfortunately, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but there was an interpretation that 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 it was over height considerably, uh, and that uh, and that we we should react um, or or we were just pushing uh, pushing that interpretation too far. So we did. We flattened the roof. Um, we're quite happy with where it's landed. Uh, if anything, we've increased the amenity space on the western side by getting rid of this sort of stepping terrace. Um, uh, so basically, it's gone from this element to this element. Uh, so it's more or less the flat zone, and then the the amenity zone on the on the west. The um, um, uh, the other thing that I think the panel had raised was just the the concern about achieving all of this and coordinating it. And I can assure you that we have coordinated the mechanical requirements, uh, even the uh, window washing cradle requirements, and uh, everything into the roofscape. So. Um, finally, there was a question about uh, at the panel about how exactly all these interlinked terraces worked, and this is that diagram in a sense. Now, what we're trying to do, um, part of the story of our building, is that you can every floor will either have a terrace itself or access to a terrace via uh, an atrium. And if you got a, 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 a tenancy who could uh, interconnect floors and leverage this then in theory, there is a way, uh, and in theory, and this is what we want to push, that there's a way up through the building via these sort of terraces and um, atriums that is uh, against the, 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 the traditional go to the core type vertical circulation uh, premise uh, and create sort of a more meandering path that companies could leverage a, a neat experience from. It will be
Leon, can you text? Uh, I don't hear um, him anymore. Can we text him? Okay, yeah, I'm I'm gonna reach out to him. Okay, great. Seems like it's him because I'm still seeing everybody else. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. He just left. I think he's gonna rejoin. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear everybody else. Yeah, me too. Uh, this is Elsa with 3C. Um, he was essentially done his um, portion of the presentation. Maybe we can transition to the landscape just to sure. have time. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Is that Fung Lee is going to yeah. speak? Yes, hi there. Um, hi, hi, Fung. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? Good. Uh, I'm going to, um, you know what? Um, I. I believe that my camera is not, I'm, I'm in that yellow square there. So yeah. I apologize that uh, unfortunately. I'm I am really, hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Greg. Uh, yeah. Really, really. I, I thought I was through the technical headache. Uh, and my internet does not normally drop. I have no idea what happened. I'm very, very, very sorry. But Greg, are you finished now? I, I was actually finished the architectural section. All right. Okay. I'm so really let's... sorry. I hope that doesn't count against us for time. No, I was oh, fine. No. I'm so really no worries. Uh, see if you can take over, Fun. Okay. All right. Um, how do I um, get the presentation back? Do you, Do you want me to keep driving? Do you trust me? Yeah. <laughs> I think <laughs> I mean, we've we've done do you, it. Do you have Do you yeah. all still have it on screen with the roofscape render? No, no, we don't. I think you have to reshare your screen okay, again. Okay, I will do that. Uh, again, I'm I'm appealing to your trust here, Fung, because I've never had that happen, but today was, of course, Saad's Law. There we go. That's do you see it? Murphy's yes. Law. Yep. Okay. Okay. Have you got that, uh, Fung? Okay. All yeah. right. Yes. There you go. Okay. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Great. Thanks. Uh, so my name again is Fung Li. I'm with PMA Landscape Architects, and um, I'll take you through the presentation today. Um, I won't go um, through the feedback point by point. I think Josh did a good summary already. But what I did want to emphasize is that um, is that first point that we really want to go through um, from the beginning. Our kind of um, our um, kind of revisit the party and um, the concept, the driving concept, and really. Um, quite seriously, uh, look at that first comment was, which was about making a strong landscape design, a kind of more singular strategy. And I think uh, what we heard from the panel was also about um, um, making sure that the interim plaza had high impact immediately. Um, so we wanted to um, look at um, uh, our, our kind of point of reference and inspiration is definitely the, the heritage landscape of Toronto's waterfront and looking at the um, kind of open water uh, wetlands of the 1700s and before to the, um, the 1800s and this kind of, um, you know, the remnants that we still see, the industrial waterfront taking um, inspiration from some of the timber crib walls um, and piles and, um, and then into today, um, the waterfront um, uh, public realm uh, improvements. And so this was, um, sec oh, this section, oh, sorry. Can we go back to that section, Greg? Um, the, um, we just wanted to kind of demonstrate um, this was an investigation in, in terms of where our development sat within the evolution of uh, the waterfront, and which was kind of interesting where at one point, um, so these are sections from Front Street to Keating, and at one point that it sat, um, you know, sort of within the water, um, and then to within the wetlands um, to the industrial waterfront and into the kind of urban fabric um, or the edge of the urban fabric as it is now. Uh, and then um, 
we want to also take the concept um, that um, Greg had already kind of introduced and this kind of idea of this, you know, refined building and where the landscape sits in that is both kind of complementary and as a foil to it in terms of this kind of refined to raw landscape and using stone and um, and and reference of these timber crib walls and these kind of large timbers um, and and uh, grounding it in, into this kind of wild landscape and planting regime at the bottom. Uh, sorry, um, uh, sorry if you have some the laughing children in the background. Apologize. Um, uh, and then this, uh, and then the other, the kind of other notion and concept was basically about um, this is a section through our plaza and about this kind of gradient of experience that from the ends, the north and south ends of the plaza, that you um, kind of enter as this quiet landscape that kind of. Um, increases in complexity and intensity um, as you enter the plaza and through sculpted topography and large boulders, um, the large timbers, and that there's this kind of crescendo of landscape experience. And uh, this AXO is kind of demonstrating the overall landscape concept. And as Greg kind of already pointed out that, you know, we, we have this, you know, these this kind of feathering of the green and spiraling down that kind of lands into our plaza at the bottom. And as you can see at the bottom, you know, this kind of refined to raw idea and this um, kind of, um, um, you know, kind of increasing, again, this gradient of, of increased complexity and experience as you enter the plaza proper. And then um, from on the uh, left side there, that is what we showed in November of 2019. And then on the right side, of course, today's concept. And 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 we also wanted to very much focus on, um, you know, the critique um, that we re-examined ourselves that we, you know, wholly agree with about how um, previously it was kind of uh, what we interpreted the, the kind of scattered um, kind of concept, um, you know, uh, kind of discouraging a lot of the movable elements that we had before and then into kind of our current concept where we have a more singular vision. Um, we've kind of limited the, the mobile furniture and that we really mm -hmm. um, took into consideration making this, um, what this interim plaza into that it doesn't have to behave and function like an interim condition or temporary condition, that it can be have high impact and high programming capabilities from day one. And so we took, um, so looking uh, particularly at the plaza, you know, we took, of course, the point of reference of of the building and not only in the in, in the geometry, but also in the, this experience of this pass through lobby terminating into our, you know, kind of more simplified plaza. And then as well, mm -hmm. taking a look three dimensionally at the building and where we can kind of also reference, you know, this almost this this kind of architectural topography and also put that into the landscape as well through through berming and through um, you know boulders and also creating this kind of um, um, kind of referencing also this this sculpted topography. And this is a view of our um, our new plaza. And uh, as you can see, it's a more kind of singular space, but there's also definitely opportunity for kind of large group gathering as well as small group and individual um, um, uh, seating areas. And then this is a um, and then this is a, a diagram demonstrating the permanent. Um, versus temporary and versus what we are hoping uh, and that we feel pretty confident in is, is this kind of recycling of materials and the salmon color being the permanent areas and the uh, hatched areas being what we're protecting for the future Trinity and future Queens Key and as well the future lakefront public realm uh, at the north end of that plaza. The red being the areas where we are selecting um, for now, uh, for today, and even in the interim, these resilient materials and furnishings that we can stockpile and reuse for the future permanent plaza. And then as well, the planting that um, that I'll go into in a little more detail, but we're you know wanting to use this really resilient, fast establishing uh, pioneer ecologies um, that are you know not precious, but can give us you know, what we need in terms of placemaking for today. And there is a view of the plaza from the south end um, and uh, looking north. And here's a view um, looking into the plaza and addressing the uh, seasonal, um, the seasonal aspect and as well the um, uh, through 
lighting through seasonal interest in the planting itself and then as well um, the limited mobile uh, seating. And then we want to address about how we considered and protected for the future um, streetscape developments and connections. And uh, this is a view from Lakeshore um, um, going south um, through the plaza uh, and um, uh, the interim Martin Goodman condition. And then at the top there, uh, referencing the future Queen's Key, and as you can see in the plan, um, how we're referencing the red brick um, at the kind of forecourt and entry to our pass-through lobby. Uh, and then as well at the bottom, how we're protecting for the future Trinity Street and as well the, the, the waterfront um, public realm and connections to uh, the distillery. And um, a snapshot of um, um, some things we're exploring that I'll, I'll go into a little more detail later. But again, this refined to raw idea of this machine building, um, metal um, mobile furniture, and then this use of stone and from a refined to a kind of raw, if you will, um, uh, through aggregate and boulders, uh, large timbers, and um, temporary fencing that uh, we'll be using uh, for both um, kind of visual screening, but as well for safety uh, and, and hoarding for the future um, build out. And then, um, you know, very quickly about the planting approach, um, as I mentioned, you know, we want to use, you know, a lot of these pioneering ecologies that, um, that actually kind of exist, uh, um, you know, within the area um, and, and use this because uh, of its resiliency, of its sort of fast establishing. We can establish quickly shade and microclimate and again contribute to the kind of placemaking of the plaza um, very quickly. And that um, in uh, even as an interim state that, um, you know, as beautiful as it will be, it, 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 they're not, it's not a precious landscape that um, the optics of us, um, you know, we're not removing large caliper trees by any means. And that's a view from the pass-through lobby into our, our plaza space. And then quickly into the terraces, and, and uh, uh, Greg had already uh, kind of summarized uh, um, uh, uh, that basically, um, and then we'll go into the plan. That basically uh, um, the, um, the terraces are acting as spill out uh, for the floors themselves, obviously to contribute this kind of woolly edge along the green contributing to the kind of urban design effect. But they are, um, you know, spaces, amenity spaces, uh, as much as the plaza are for, um, you know, outdoor meeting rooms, um, outdoor workstations, uh, just, you know, just simple retreat uh, for the users and tenants. And the, the idea of the design here is definitely on a more kind of on the refined scale of things with permanent planters and furnishings. But we also want to definitely try to carry some of the similar kind of native species and ecologies, you know, quick growing, um, this is our pioneer site. I'll be very exposed up uh, on, on the terraces there and uh, to kind of create, again, that immediate microclimate and coziness um, to the terraces um, and uh, also uh, at the same time give opportunities for people to kind of um, um, get to the edge and, and kind of appreciate the panoramic views. And then my last slide um, um, with regards to materiality that we're, we're kind of exploring right now and Definitely taking cues from some of the uh, a lot of the granite and the red and and the grays of of, of some a lot of the uh, water from public realm um, projects and um, and and borrowing the metal uh, in in the in the in this in the mobile furnishings and um, decking up on the roof and um, and similar pavers to the ground floor. <laughs> and I'll leave. I'll take it to Kyle or Lyle. Sorry, Lyle. <laughs> No problem. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yep. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so here to talk a little bit about sustainability and uh, one of the first things that I just want to touch base on the project will be registering for LEED certification. Uh, we are targeting a gold certification level. Uh, one of the things that's great about LEED is that uh, the breadth of topics that it addresses. Um, so although today we're going to focus on the feedback that we've heard from water from Toronto, um, and the city of Toronto. Um, the project is also looking at all those topics, water efficiency, materiality, health, and other sustainability topics um, that we don't have time to discuss today. 
um, the lead gold strategy is counting on the expansion of the public transit system uh, to provide the required uh, frequent travel uh, transit service uh, to the site. Um, at our last Waterfront Toronto presentation, we were asked to explore Toronto Green Standard uh, in tier two. Um, and we're going to touch base on that um, as we move forward. Uh, we are very close to a tier two level of energy performance. Um, we also have the service of green roof coverage that follows the Waterfront Toronto precedent. Uh, uh, and we follow the Waterfront Toronto precedent of design uh, mechanical penthouses. Um, Energy efficiency, it's a really complicated topic. Um, but as we said um, on the next slide, energy performance is currently near the Toronto Green Standard tier two levels. Um, one of the things that I, I really want to highlight here is that we are achieving the uh, tier two requirement for greenhouse gas emission reduction. Um, we're actually significantly below it. Um, and uh, I guess everyone's entitled to their opinions, but in, in terms of climate change, that's the most important um, metric um, the way that I see it. Um, we're close on the other two metrics. One of the ones that we're focusing in on is the thermal energy demand. And as we go on to the next slide, you'll see um, what we have um, is we, we've looked at the sources for um, the thermal energy demand and by far glazing is the largest source of uh, thermal energy demand. Walls, ventilation, and filtration are also other large sources requiring attention. Um, when you take a look at an image of the project, uh, there's a couple of things that really strike you. Um, and it's, we talked about the machined facade. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about this facade. Um, we, you know, was focusing on the energy and efficiency and sustainability aspects of the project. Um, really hoping that this facade is an example for other projects to follow. Uh, the daylight is great. You can see the images on the, on the top left there that you're gonna have ample daylighting. Um, and the glazing ratio is rated in around that 50% that Greg mentioned. So it's very effective at reducing energy consumption and the associated greenhouse gas emissions. To go on to the next slide. You know, what, uh, what we're seeing is uh, very significant outdoor amenity spaces. Um, some of the concepts that we're evaluating are influenced by the design. Um, for example, the occupants are encouraged to utilize the outdoor terraces. We're looking for ways to encourage healthy movement options between floors that favor the use of the stairs and these outdoor interconnected ramping terraces. Um, now, you know, I thought that this image was, was very good at explaining one of the challenges that we're seeing with renewable energy is that we're, we have a, a very ample outdoor amenity space um, and we're in compliance with the, um, the city of Toronto green roof bylaw. And that really doesn't leave a lot of space for any renewables on the site. Um, on to another one of our challenges um, is stormwater. And so we've we've been exploring our ability to achieve Toronto Green Standard tier two performance. Um, and as we mentioned, we're really close on energy. Um, we feel that compliance with tier two energy targets is something that we're going to continue to push towards. But stormwater is a challenge. Uh, we are achieving the tier one requirements. Um, we're looking to use um, the, uh, all of the, um, the stormwater for irrigation. Um, however, the tier two requirement uh, is significantly higher. Um, and at this stage, the project is finding it difficult to consider a tier two compliance strategy until they uh, have uh, an anchor tenant uh, secured that they could uh, have these discussions. District energy is something that the city of Toronto raised. Um, we currently do not have a district energy connection available. Um, the team did meet with N Wave in February, and we have incorporated design features, including full size heating and cooling hydronic risers and physical space for the district energy transfer station uh, to accommodate a future uh, connection to district energy. Um, we just heard about landscaping. 
Uh, there's a lot of fantastic things that are going on from a landscape perspective that are highly sustainable. Um, just a few uh, I'd like to mention again are the temporary planting is selected for ease of transplanting into permanent locations for subsequent development phases. Um, similarly, the hardscape items will be selected to allow for relocation and reuse into the next phase of development of those aspects of hardscape that will need to be relocated. And then they're doing a lot of the right things also with the irrigation of the rainwater, uh, drought tolerant, adaptive, and native species. So um, I, I know we had a couple glitches there as far as <laughs> the technology goes. Um, uh. But this, I, I, we're, uh, Greg, I think I'm going to hand it over to you now. Yeah, well, that, that, that concludes the presentation. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we'll move to uh, questions from the panel. And I just remind everybody, it's uh, about 25 to 12, and we're slated <clears throat> to finish this item pretty close to 12. <clears throat> and I'm going to follow <clears throat> uh, a list. Uh, so when I call your name out, please... Uh, uh, ask your question if you have any, otherwise I'll just keep moving on. So let's start off with uh, Betsy, please. No questions, Paul. Okay, George. Yes, I, uh, this is, uh, mine is on the landscape and it's the, it requires the slide that um, um, showed the previous proposal site plan together with the revised one. Can we bring that up? Yeah, let me try and find it. Um... It was pretty early on in the landscape it's presentation. It's coming. I think it's that, George. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, yes. 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 Basically, I just um, I just want to make sure I understand this. So you mm -hmm. have slightly extended the project area in order to provide more of that uh, area, the boulevard on the north curb of the future Queen Ski. Have I understood that correctly? Uh, yes, I would say that that we have. That's right. right. We've, we've extended okay. it all the way down. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I'd understood that correctly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. No other questions, George? No. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, Peter. Yeah, I, um, I just, uh, not sure I caught it, but um, one of our questions last time was, the reality of the landscape up on the benches in the in the building. I wonder if the landscape architect could just um, talk about soil depth and the and the kind of planting up there. Mm -hmm. uh, but the imagery that we've seen is supported by uh, by actual planning. Mm -hmm. uh, on the terraces or on uh, at grade? On the terraces. On the upper terraces. Yeah, um, yeah, I could speak to that. Yeah, we um, are kind of, I mean, it's still a little bit early stages, but we are definitely uh, kind of working with the architects and structural to kind of say that we will have these, you know, um, substantial loads. I think um, where we have high canopy trees, which uh, will be on, um, I think it, it'll be on the level um, kind of uh, four and five terraces, you know, we'll have raised planters basically that will accommodate up to three feet of soil, but pretty much I think the rest of the, um, the rest of the raised planters will be probably around in the realm of like um, two and a half feet and, um, and, and which will use more kind of smaller tree, large shrub um, type of um, size of planting and kind of establish um, I will probably, in reality, select things that will have a smaller ball and then grow into that planter. But again, you know, kind of using like that understory kind of type of species to kind of still kind of achieve some kind of level of, of shade and, and kind of microclimate. Um, but they, they, there will have to be raised planters to accommodate the soil volumes. You okay, Peter? Yeah, no, that's okay. good. All right, uh, let's move to Bridget, please. Yeah, my question, can you go back to the image that showed the two, the, in the landscape uh, deck uh, that showed November 2019 and then the current um, in the ground floor plan that we were looking at with um, George's comment? Yeah. Yeah, that one. This one, yeah. Thank you. Um, so in the November 2019, it looks like there's kind of an indentation uh, where the pass through lobby is with the overhang of the kind of uh, uh, building mass above providing a, more of a canopy. 
um, it's close to just to the right of the dot that says number three. Yeah. And then when I look at April 2020, um, it looks like that entrance, which was recessed, is actually coming out to the edge of the mass up above. Is is that? I'm just trying to understand the the shift in the lobby space in terms of what is exterior and interior. Yeah, uh, Bridget, I'll probably be best to speak to that as Greg. Um, so so that is the line of the building terrace above, and we have a sort of a. a a portico feature that's three stories there uh, and we did swing that entrance around to the west um, so it's not as as deep I think one of the criticisms we received fairly on this is that it was sort of a bit hidden around the corner and we were putting too much emphasis on a retail unit just at the corner of Trinity and and, uh, and Quincy. And then just to follow up, um, if I look at the November 2019, I see a, a fairly deep recess for the service and parking entrance. And then in April, I see a more flush condition. Yeah, it's it, it it's that's probably just a graphic because in, in both cases, there there's going to be a door right along that line anyhow. Okay. Um, and then the, and then the, the next question is just on the north side, um, on the Lakeshore Boulevard side. Yeah. It looks like in your April 2020, there's an indentation just south of the Martin Goodman Trail. <clears throat> and is that a service entrance, or I just it, couldn't understand it, it, what it was? It's service. This this zone on that wall, unfortunately, has to be service. We just have to find somewhere to get into <clears throat> the, the service spaces in the basement, like the electrical. So it is. <clears throat> it is a reset. And just to, just uh, to follow up, so for what you're calling your pass through lobby, mm -hmm. the e entrance to access this north south uh, linear landscape is next to the stair that I'm seeing. Yeah, it's it's okay. right it's right there, uh, Bridget. Okay, so we, so that's an exit a... stair from up above coming down. It is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank Good. you very much. Lovely. Yeah, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> thanks, Bridget. Okay, uh, Fatty, please. Um, <clears throat> just a quick question uh, of clarification. Uh, so is this landscape, I recall there was a temporality aspect to it in the previous presentation. Mm -hmm. Is this idea that this would be now more permanent or is there still another um, stage in which this uh, north-south landscape specifically which it would be altered in the future stage mm -hmm. yeah yeah perfect yeah this diagram and uh, sorry that I was flipping through quickly or just being concerned about time but this diagram is demonstrating the salmon area which is the the permanent um uh, landscape area mm -hmm. and then um and then otherwise everything um as you can see east of that will will be um, either removed or recycled basically so the red is kind of demonstrating um, um, you know some of the pavers that we um, that we feel that we can kind of stockpile and recycle and and the furnishings and even the boulders I mean not you know none of this without some labor but but the intent is that mm -hmm. part of it would be permanent part of it would be um, removed and recycled and then part of it would be like um, particularly the um, the planting being this you know kind of early successional planting would be right. removed um, and um, anything we can salvage of course we could we could um, um, uh, try to but the idea is that the vegetation would largely be removed and is there a time frame for this like is there do you know approximately is this like five years two years that, Ten that's, years. that's a good question um, <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not it, sure. The, the problem is that that's a sort of a development timeline decision, which is pretty tough to make in any market. Sure, in sure, sure. world we're in right now. I, I only ask because of the the age of the plants and their maturity yeah, in, yeah. in a specific sure. time frame. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Eric, um, let's go with Nina Marie, please. Oh, thank you very much. Um, really much improved in so many ways. I don't have any further questions. Fadi uh, has already asked the question I would have asked. Thank you. Okay, great. On to Eric. Yes, um, just one question. The, uh, and actually, if you go to the slide, maybe a couple of slides before, I think 49. Uh, before. Yes, this one. Maybe just on the, so on the April 20th. Is this the, uh, just, uh, are you along the, western edge uh, sorry eastern edge of your building so where your lobby retail is as well as the 
uh, retail unit that is to the uh, to yep. the west. Uh, are you protecting for so when is a future plaza? My question: Are you protecting for future openings uh, for spillage? Because uh, just thinking that whatever, if you have a cafe, restaurant, or a bar, uh, is it? Are you protecting for the ability to open uh, open um, the windows or the the uh, panels so people the activities can spill onto the futures plaza and that future north south uh, pedestrian connection? Um, oh, sorry. Do you want to go? Want to answer that? I can. Yeah, I, I can tackle that. Yeah, I, I think definitely we do anticipate that. Um, um, that that kind of um, if you want to look at uh, in that kind of green um, planting area, that kind of um, southernmost finger, I guess, if you will, um, you know, probably in that area um, um, that that would definitely be opened up, um, uh, at least, um, um, you know, landscape wise anyways, into mm -hmm. the future. Plot. Yeah, uh, so, my, my, my question is more with regard to the architecture for. Yeah, are, no, are you no able, yeah. Are you going to be able to open all of that uh, during nice summer months so you can help to animate the space yeah yeah no question we the, one of the reasons we, we've always emphasized a retail unit here is because we there's a 10 meter required sort of zone you can actually see the dash line of the other development and and this is a, a is a real thoroughfare between the plaza and possibly trinity or you know further north on and, and, and quite frankly getting off your bike on on martin goodman so we really do want to activate this i mean <laughs> right now we've just got um sets of, of, of doors that are in the in the architecture. Whether we could amp that up and do something more, I think has to sort of go into sort of a, a retail discussion and, and the type of tendencies that's in here. But hopefully it's sort of like a cafe or something that we could, mm -hmm. we're trying to set up for it, but um, um, you know, we need a little bit more info to plan to it. Yep, thank okay. you. Okay, uh, let's go to Pat, please. Um, I don't have any questions, thanks. Okay, and I'm not sure, is Jenna uh, with us? I haven't yeah, seen her. Yeah, I'm yet. on the line. Oh, you're there. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Take it away. Any questions, Jenna? Yeah, just one brief one. Thanks. Um, on slide 20, um, where you talk about the Vine system, um, I'm wondering, I know you said that you've done research about it, but have you found out where they've actually used it, how long it's been used for, What's the maintenance regime in order to keep it healthy? Um, well, we've got we've got these guys on board, and we're just I mean, we just did this the sort of schematic level to make sure that we were we were reinforcing the design with something pragmatic and starting to think about the m and &E issues. So I, I would I would say, no, we don't, but we have the people on, you know, I, I don't have the detail answer to what you're asking, but we have the people on board right now that are going to take us through all that. Uh, to make sure that we do something smart with it. So, thank I don't know if that's a perfect answer, but um, that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank, thank you Appreciate very much. Uh, I'm going to move now to uh, comments uh, from the panel, and I'll just go through the list again. I'll read your names out. So, Betsy, do you want to uh, offer some thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Paul. I, maybe I'll, I'll start off just by thanking the team for the um, incredible amount of work and actually really thinking through the comments that the panel put out last time in a, in a thoughtful and um, kind of inventive way. Um, I'm really pleasantly, um, uh, I'm not going to even say surprised because I know you could do it, but uh, I'm really pleased by the uh, work that you've put together for this proposal and um, I'm supportive of it. Um, the one small um, piece that I had is, as I know that you're challenged with railings and, and depths of the planters on those uh, meandering um, uh, paths that go up and around the building. So if you could potentially raise the height of some of that plant material so you can see it from the street and can engage it in the way that you intend, I think would be my only comment um, on the project right now. I just wanted to congratulate you on a, on a good proposal. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Betsy. George? Uh, well, I, I let me reiterate um, Betsy's compliments. I, too, think the, the responsiveness of the team to our commentary from last time has been um, gratifying. So, um, well done uh, in that regard. I just have one small thought, and it goes back to 
Pat Hansen's concern expressed last time. I don't know if she's going to bring it up again or not, but it, it had to do with her pushing for stainless steel for the cladding instead of the anodized aluminum. Uh, and I, and you've said, no, you're going to stick with anodized steel. And I meant this is among other things, uh, a budget consideration. Um, I would suggest, I think where you're most vulnerable with the anodized aluminum front faces of between your your vertical glazing strips, hey, we're not here. I was wondering if, if um, and the you know the precedent you showed in London that you'd actually detail um, the story. Well, I, my mic is. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Maybe you should um, turn your camera off, George, to save some bandwidth. Okay. Yeah, we're missing a lot of words, George. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, I, oh, oh, uh, I see. Um, no, you're breaking up. Uh, I'm turning off yeah. my camera. Okay, I'm, I'm tur I've turned off my camera. I see. Um, I was. I suggest that you think a heavier gauge aluminum on the front faces of the piers than on the returns to the glaze, because it seems to me it's the front face where you're most vulnerable to dimpling. Agree, agree. Did Understood. that get through? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's really my only comment, and um, otherwise I'm quite pleased with the modifications. Thank you. Thanks, George. Okay. Uh, Peter. Hi. Um, I also am uh, pleased with the improvements in this project, in particular uh, the uh, level portal and the alignment uh, with with the access down street and the and the, and the bend in the street. Um, the inclusion of the retail triangle in the lobby space is a great improvement. I think it'll be uh, it'll, it'll really help with the transparency. Uh, it'll help with the sense of. Uh, of openness uh, in, into the building, and uh, I actually think it'd be a great space to have a coffee then, and uh, it's seen as part of the lobby and controlled by the architects for the building, as opposed to a third-party um, uh, extravaganza. Um, uh, and like George, I'm interested in the. Um, I'm fine with the aluminum, not the stainless steel. I'm interested in the quality of the metal panels. I'm trusting it's not a Luca bond. I'm trusting it's a heavier metal that's uh, break formed uh, as part of a, a rain screen solution. Uh, Greg, can you just confirm that? that I, is I guarantee it's not a Luca bond because we have a, a, a actually a fire risk concern about laminated aluminum panels, um, which we've been fighting technically on a number of buildings. So Good. I will make a personal guarantee. <laughs> that's great. I mean, my problem with a Luca bond is uh, from a recycling point of view. So, uh, so anyway, so. Uh, a thicker metal, as George said, that um, prevents oil canning. I'm pleased with the reduction in um, glazing as a percent of the elevations. I think that the projections of the uh, of the components of the elevation will provide uh, shading, and uh, um, I, I uh, support the encouragement uh, from Betsy of, of of making sure those. The greenery on the planters is visible. The whole idea of the building is this terracing, spiraling uh, greenery up the building. If we can't see it, it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to come off as as the renderings. So, uh, uh, so hopefully you go there. And uh, but apart from that, I'm very supportive of the project at this point in time. Okay, thanks, Peter. Uh, Bridget. Uh, yeah, can we go back to the. Uh, drawing in the landscape deck that had November 2019 and April 2020 side by side. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to um, concur with my colleagues in terms of complimenting the team on the kind of uh, efforts that were made. Um, my comments are two specific comments. One um, is that throughout Waterfront Toronto, what I see is an emerging um, fairly unique public realm of these mid-block passages. They typically occur in residential buildings further west, um, but it's actually a kind of new type of public space. Uh, and in your case, it's an uh, office building, not a residential building, but I actually feel that the pass-through lobby um, 
while improving, needs to kind of signal a kind of publicness of the pass through more clearly. And um, I understand the kind of spatial configuration, but I guess I feel that even in the way the ground plane is developed, if we're looking at the April 2020 diagram, the space between your elevator lobbies and your triangular uh, retail space could actually be rendered as public space. So whether that is a kind of certain kind of concrete or uh, something that signals public because you're actually drawing people through the lobby from one end to your north-south pedestrian passage on the other side. And so if let's say the, the ground floor, the, the material of the ground plane is continuous between the pass-through lobby and the triangular piece, it starts to become a bit different than if, if you really read it almost trying to uh, make it a, a, a more public reading passage as opposed to a three-story lobby of an office building. So I just feel that the kind of this, this unique location that you are at the bend in Queen's Key needs to somehow ripple through that lobby space so that the publicness of it is actually expressed as opposed to the kind of you're entering a regular lobby. And I feel that it's partly such a unique location along Queen's Key that I feel there's a certain responsibility of this project to really um, do everything it can to kind of uh, underline this public dimension while knowing that you're entering a kind of a, you know, revolving doors and there are revolving doors at the other end. But I feel like that that feeling of publicness would only benefit the project as a whole, benefit the retail space and then contribute to this emerging public realm that I'm seeing throughout Waterfront Toronto. Uh, my second comment is related to the landscape and I really appreciate the shift of reading temporary versus permanent. Um, I appreciate this idea of the emerging pioneering ecology landscape. <clears throat> I felt that the kind of metal chairs seemed a little fragile for the kind of, it's a very windy site. For a long time, it'll be maybe the only building. We don't quite know the time frame. So I feel like um, I appreciate that they are a counterpoint to the more bigger timber pieces. It's just, I think there's a kind of uh, a certain scale of uh, not getting blown away in the wind and while also adding the color and the shift of scale that I think you're after. So I think the selection of those material, those sort of furniture pieces become actually quite key in this kind of idea of temporary versus permanent in this emerging public realm. But uh, keep, keep uh, going and then look forward to seeing it uh, in person. Thank you. Okay, thanks Bridget. Uh, Fadi? Hello. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just took a second to unmute. Um, yes, I want to echo everyone's comments for the excellent presentation. Um, I especially appreciated uh, some of the background information that you provided, those diagrams that sort of contextualize the site and celebrate the evolution of the waterfront from um, a wetland to an industrial lot and the kind of idea around the material from refined to raw. There's a lot of really great sort of background content that really helps situate the design process. So I think that's really wonderful. I also think the integration of the site with Lakeshore and the gardener, uh, especially from a planting palette and a circulation perspective it, and durability and maintenance, the whole sort of temporality uh, perspective into this is, is much improved and really interesting and very good. Um, I also want to give you some kudos, kudos on the kind of amplification and showcasing of the sort of pioneering, adaptive, and emergent ecologies and planting palettes that you were thinking about um, and how it goes in tandem with the furnishing and the pavings that I think are pretty elegant. Um, I would advise you to maybe take this approach for the rest of the 3C development public realm and thinking about how you stage uh, the relationship between public realm, construction sites, future development, especially as this area starts to get uh, densified and more and more people uh, begin to kind of traverse um, from uh, north of the lakeshore um, and Gardner and into the waterfront. And while at the same time, people are traveling east uh, along um, Queens Key and, uh, you know, the, the central waterfront uh, eastward. So I think there's this kind of an interesting methodology that you have here, especially from a, from a public realm planting perspective. And I think 
it would be really great to kind of figure a way to extend that as a method for the rest of the site uh, and the development overall. Thank you. Okay, uh, Nina Marie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, after Fadi, I don't have so much to say again, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, echo everyone else. This was a really uh, lovely surprise and lovely resolution um, to see so much work has happened here, and in particular, the nuance and care around the integration of landscape from public from construction site to public realm. And you know, you're really playing with ideas of permanence and impermanence. Even though we know that at some point, date to be determined, this landscape will be removed, the site will continue to evolve architecturally, and yet there really is an a, a, a neat opportunity here to showcase from a legibility perspective the resilience, toughness, and adaptability of the species you're selecting, even if they're cultivars of native species, they're so appropriate and at small caliper size, really flexible, um, nimble, really. It's a landscape that where you can really have some fun with that gradient, and you've really shown that you don't have to be locked into the kind of standard um, lollipop nature band-aid <laughs> selection that is so common in a project like this for reasons beyond our control. So thank you for those efforts. Um, you really rose to the challenge of the comments in a tough site. And I hope that there really is, as Fadi has just suggested, some opportunity to carry that gradient-based approach um, on a public legibility perspective. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Eric. Eric, are you there? Yes, I am. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, thank you very much for a great presentation. I think this uh, the project has evolved, uh, evolved very, very, very nicely. Uh, it is a, uh, a unique site and a difficult site, but the you know I see the overall that it's a very unique building that is being proposed here. I think it has a it provides a good diversity uh, for the, the whole area. Uh, I think the edges, um, you know, giving the that the edges is being very well treated at the ground floor that the the location of retail and how it's engaging in such a small condensed site is is quite good uh, that the uh, also think that the corner uh, where the pass through lobby is located has uh, that corner has very much improved in terms of view view terminus the way the the green is frame uh, is framing it the um, one of the essential element in building on on uh, on George's comment is that yes the that it's a simple beautiful kind of jewel of a building and I think the green is essential that however we we uh, you you that the the techniques to plan to make sure the greenery on the building is um, is uh, can can mature and be very 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 visible and uh, the other my other comment is the uh, which I mentioned in my in my question is I think the especially on the west east side of the building so ensuring that you're protecting for you know for the flexibility of the retail of or cafe shop to be able to open up as much as possible the ground floor to be able to have spillage during the nice uh, uh, nice season uh, so again a um, uh, despite greg being a chelsea fan which i will not uh, <laughs> hold against him i think um i think it's a it's a fabulous uh, i think it's a it's a good addition to a very good addition to the waterfront thank I'm you i'm so glad you brought that chelsea thing up because it's been uh, it's been uh, the back of it's there to provoke <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's an issue. It's definitely an issue. Uh, uh, Leon, you don't have to put the Chelsea comment in the minutes. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, let's go. Uh, two panel members left to comment. Uh, Jana first, please, and then uh, Pat. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Paul. And I, I again, I want to echo all my colleagues. I think it's really much improved, and I really actually am enjoying the button-down quality of the massing and the, you know, the restraint of the, cladding i think it's really uh really come a long way i just wanted to pick up on bridget's comments about the lobby and if you go to slide 14 i just wanted to offer a couple of observations to really um augment the sense of publicness of of the lobby and of the process through that passage um and i think this is a good drawing because it shows conceptually i think where it could have a little bit of improvement. And I think it has to be from the street, you have to think about 
how is someone or people going to move through this space? So, for instance, the um, the scale and size and orientation of the entry vestibule piece seems to me. I know it's oriented towards the terminus of the street, but I think it could be tweaked a bit so that the space is north and south of the actual entry vestibule piece could be a little bit bigger. I see there's a column at the south end, but at the north end, maybe it's a little bit bigger so someone can stand there and wait for a cab and it's a, a kind of meaningful, enjoyable space. And it seems like there's an excess of room in the width of the vestibule. And then moving through, I think it's, not only about having the lobby flooring relate to the pass-through flooring, but I would really encourage you to think about the sidewalk and the landscape south of that glass wall as part of that pass-through lobby experience, because that's going to be an incredible view down there. And I think any way that you can create a reciprocal relationship there uh, would be really interesting and uh, a great benefit. And then finally, at the um, eastern side, I'd really encourage you to um, expand the length of the circular door and the person door to maybe you need to pull the retail um, space of that glass up a little bit. I think it's quite tight there if you mm -hmm. think about people going in and out of the retail, people coming in and out of the doors as it is. But if you think of the, um, the opportunity to allow for a sinuous connection in from one side, from the west side, and out through the east side to connect visually with the um, plaza, I think that would be absolutely fantastic. And right now, it seems like it's it's just um, it's just taken up with you know uh, doors. And it seems to me a really missed opportunity to frame the next really important public space, which is that new plaza. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Congratulations. Uh uh, Pat, please. Hi. Yeah, I, I echo everybody else's comments. I've always thought this actually was a, a good looking building and I've always appreciated the rigor of the facade and the patterning of the facade and how it actually unifies uh, the kind of massing of the, of the project. And I, I, I hope you didn't think I was suggesting the building should be in stainless. It was just a comment that some of the renderings we're reading very reflective and you know giving sending the wrong message about what ultimately an aluminum clad building would actually appear like yeah. um and, and just one comment about aluminum because we've considered using it on many projects there is there's a product it's it's an aluminum cladding called animat i don't know if you know it um it's the aluminum cladding that uh the office sauna did on the Guggenheim uh, Museum in France. Right. And it actually has a very, very um, mild shimmer to it. It's a it's a stunning material. So as you move forward, it, I think it's a little bit more than um, regular kind of North American aluminum, but it, it it's worth looking at. It's a beautiful product. Um, so I, I, I just want to say, I think the, the building looks great. I, there's just a couple of things and it was prompted um, from Peter's comments. So if you were to go to page 22, and I'm sure you'll figure this out. It's just, it's um, Peter's comments were uh, a, a concern about planting depth and ensuring that the um, planting and the greenery of the building has a good chance of survival and maturity. Um, and the planting depth. So when I look at this facade, there's a couple of things I think that need to be considered as you develop the project further. I'm probably stating the obvious, but that is when you look at the planter depth, how does it affect the facade? Mm -hmm. um, do you end up with more spandrel panels? Um, particularly at the entrance, there seems to be a kind of optimism about the depth of the structure um, I'm looking at the sort of major portical piece, right? The depth of the structure and then soil depth of the planting. So I, I think the sort of massaging of those details as you go up through the building will be key to maintaining the sort of rigor um, and the kind of full glass appearance between those piers. It's just a, just a comment, something to think about as you move forward. Great. 
Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. I'll attempt to summarize uh, the comments of the panel. I'll just start off by echoing <clears throat> how the panel appreciates uh, taking our comments from November uh, into consideration in a very serious way. Uh, one panel member, I think, summarized it and said, this is a lovely surprise. Um, I, I think with respect to the building itself, uh, <clears throat> people are quite supportive of the unique uh, nature of the building, strong edges, uh, uh, very, very diverse. It'll stand out. It'll be a lone building down there for a long time, and I think uh, it, it'll it'll uh, stand out for all of those uh, reasons that you've heard from the panel. Um, some suggestions, uh, very very minor, I think, but nevertheless to for you to consider. Uh, first of all, the ground level, um, the the retail space and the triangular space is great. Lots, but you want it to maximize the openness of that, uh, build in the and protect for future opportunities for. Uh, the cafe to open up into the square and have that uh, permeability be very, very strong with uh, uh, Queen's Key. In terms of um, the uh, actual uh, passageway, uh, I think a very good suggestion made about even though it's through a lobby and through a private building to uh, really, really emphasize the public nature of that mid-block passage consistent with many other passages that have been built and will be built on the waterfront and it's important to use and to consider different material treatment of that passageway to to really signal to the public that this is okay to walk through this is a this is a, a an open place that we want you to to penetrate from one end of the building to the other so there's a very good suggestions there um, so another comment made about the publicness of the lobby perhaps could be a little bigger even on the north end um, uh, to, to reinforce uh, that whole relationship as well. Um, in terms of um, the landscape, many comments, uh, pretty strong support for your approach to showing, showcasing overall the pioneering uh, use of uh, tough and adaptable landscape. Uh, uh, throughout the the uh, project, very strong comment that it's since the building has one distinct feature uh, among many of uh, the green roof and the terraces. It's really important to ensure that the greenery is going to be visible um, from the street. Uh, otherwise, the effect uh, and the benefits of all that will be lost. So, uh, considerations obviously of soil depth and and the materials are are critical in that. Uh, a, a comment made about, um, I think people are okay with anodized aluminum, uh, perhaps consider a thicker gauge uh, for one part of, a, uh, of the ground floor, but nevertheless, I, I think other than the comment, I think that Pat just made about, look at this unique aluminum from uh, uh, Guggenheim in France, I think people were generally okay with the anodized aluminum treatment. In terms of, um, the uh, east end of, of the building in the north-south uh, landscape area, a suggestion made about possibly expanding the length of the doors on the east side to, uh, again, just create more of a, a, a stronger link and openness uh, throughout the passageway into the landscape area uh, to the east. People understand that there's a distinction between the temporary and the permanent landscape, and obviously, you know, uh, the plaza and additional development in there will come uh, at some point in time. Um, but in summary, I think people are very supportive of what you've done, and we really appreciate that you've taken into consideration uh, our feedback from November. So I think that Peter, covers uh, most. Paul, yeah. Um, can I just make one? Um, I think I'm correcting Pat here, uh, just okay. since this museum reference is becoming important. If she means the Santa Museum in France, I think she means the branch of the Louvre in Lens. It's not, it's a branch of the Louvre, not Guggenheim, right? Oh, I, that's yeah, all right. that's yeah. the one you were talking about. So if Greg is going to check it out, make sure he's looking at the right building. And just to say, I didn't mean that the heavier gauge aluminum would only be on the ground floor. It would, it would be on the front faces of the mullions. That's all. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Understood. All right. Thank you for that correction. I want to make sure uh, you look at the right project if you're going to do that. Um, 
okay, I, I think those those are the uh, sort of general comments and the summary of, of what the panel has said. And I think we give you, I guess, Greg, an opportunity to uh, respond before we take a vote. Well, listen, I just have two things. Uh, one, uh, I think we kind of felt, and actually it's to three C's credit as well, uh, that we wanted to engage with the process and the process worked. We got good commentary. We got pushed on the things we need to get pushed on and, and, and that allowed us to focus on them. So that worked. And secondly, uh, to everyone's immense patience while I blew up in the middle of a presentation. So that's a unique experience I never want to have again, but uh, yeah. thank you for everyone for that. No, it's totally understandable. It's obviously not like being there in person, but I think no. uh, it worked. So well, thank you very much. So I would propose, uh, given the commentary, uh, a vote of support uh, for uh, this project from the panel. Is there a concurrence in that? I I, yes. Does is, is, is anyone disagree with that? Let me put it that way. Okay, then uh, recorded as being a unanimous vote of support. Great. Okay. Congratulations. Great. Great. And thank you. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Congratulations. Great. Okay, Thank so you. I guess it's a little about 10 after 12 or so, and we're scheduled to adjourn for a little lunch break. Uh, everybody still okay if we reconvene at 1245? That's perfect. Great. Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. Enjoy your lunch. Okay. okay, so do we, we're off and ready to go for Portland's flood protection. Do we have uh, Shannon Baker on the line? We do. Can you hear oh, me okay? Great. Yep. Okay. Great. I think you're going to provide the introduction, Shannon. I am. Leon, are you going to put the presentation up? Uh, yes, I? I can. I can do that. Uh, just give me one second Okay, do you see my screen? I think it's coming. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shannon Baker. I'm the project director for Parks and Public Realm for the PLFP project at Waterfront Toronto. And uh, today we're going to be going through the uh, Promontory Park South and River Park North, River Park South portions of the program. Uh, Leon, I guess if you could advance the slide, please. Thank you. So the Portland Flood Protection Project is a large landscape infrastructural project uh, in, in the downtown, just east of downtown Toronto. Um, it's uh, it's freeing up um, a large part of uh, the area in the uh, blue, which is which is currently prone to flooding from the Don River, um, and also building a number of uh, pieces of enabling infrastructure through that flood protection work. So the reconstruction of several roads in the area, and uh, in addition to the flood protection features. Uh, three new uh, very significant parks for the area. So that's what we'll be discussing this afternoon. Next. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the project is a $1.2 billion project with a number of different facets. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the pieces that we'll be focusing on today are Promontory Park South, which is identified by the letter L and River Park North and River Park South identified by the letter M on either side of the newly created Don River. The team that's with us today to present is from Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates. Uh, they are the leads, the landscape architectural leads, as well as the project integrators for Waterfront Toronto. So they, uh, their scope of work includes all of the flood protection elements, as well as uh, the park and the wetlands uh, design and um, work with the rest of the team uh, to integrate all of the aspects of, of the project and ensure that there's design con continuity across the project. This is where we're at today. Of course, uh, uh, April 22nd, Earth Day. Um, 
uh, a nice project, I think, to talk about on Earth Day. Uh, so today um, we'll be we'll be looking at the detailed design presentation for all of the parks within PLFP, and uh, the design team is moving on with a 60% submission in May for uh, Promontory Park South as well as uh, the Canoe Cove, and then in October they're bringing all of the parks and. Um, and the rest of the river finishes and landscape finishes together for a 90% submission. So again, the scopes that uh, that MVVA will be focusing on are uh, Promontory Park South, which has um, a number of different features, um, in, including the Central Lawn and Esplanade, the Canoe Cove, which is uh, along the Polson Slip and a uh, significant nature play area in River Park North. Um, and again, um, flanking the river, which has some significant natural systems, a couple of uh, wetlands and uh, some upland forest as we move into the park area. So to recap some of the uh, some of the comments and considerations from previous presentations, we first brought Parks and River to the DRP in September of 2018 and heard through that presentation uh, that uh, consideration should be given to uh, the heritage uh, features, particularly the industrial heritage of the Portlands, um, focus on the, the dynamism of the river um, and the movement of water across the landscape, integration of design elements like the, the pedestrian bridges and how those relate to the road bridges, for instance, and um, making those uh, pedestrian connections across the river valley more uh, more strong and more evident as they move north-south and accommodating um, the destination playground as well as a significant cultural institution within the plan. Uh, Pina Malazzi also brought uh, PLFP integration to the design review panel in June 2019, focusing on all of the elements of PLFP and how they relate to each other. So uh, some of the parks comments that came out of that presentation uh, also related to um, uh, developing a strategy for continuity and, and um, leveraging of discrete elements within the park consideration of, uh, of materiality, in, uh, including concrete paving on the entry paths and looking at the interior circu circulation and the consideration of uh, larger, stronger and more direct entrances to the park. And all of these comments you'll see are, are common to several of the presentations um, as we move through and, and hopefully will be, um, you'll see will have been addressed in the presentation as we move forward with MVVA. Um, and the most recent presentation, again, was uh, just in February of 2020 when we brought Promontory Park South back to the DRP. That was for um, another schematic design presentation, uh, generally uh, because um, uh, some of the design changes were significant enough that we felt we had to come back to the panel for schematic design uh, presentation, um, a lot of the technical constraints of the site, including the MT35 dock wall and, and some of the geotechnical constraints related to the lake fill uh, meant that we had to um, take a serious look at some of those proposed design elements. And um, so through that, again, uh, some common comments emerged and, and um, uh, considerations again for the edges and the esplanade. Um, uh, the paths and how they wind through the park and how those relate to the walls as well. Um, encourage, we were encouraged to be bold and, and develop some surprising elements within the park. And um, again, a lot of focus on the dynamism of the landscape and uh, uh, the movement of water across the landscape, as well as looking at uh, resilience and, and how the parks are designed to withstand that uh, increase of uh, lake level as well as uh, river uh, water as it moves through in a flood event. So finally, what we'd like to put before you today for consideration as you uh, move through MVVA's presentation 
is uh, the balance uh, between program space and design nature again, and whether or not the design team has achieved that. Uh, looking again at the, the articulation of the paths and the walls and other designed elements and how they relate to each other. The balance of um, the response to the site technical constraints. Again, those pieces that we looked at in February in terms of the uh, dock walls and the lake fill and ge geotechnical conditions. Um, the sensitive integration of the heritage elements. So pieces like the MT35 commemor commemoration and the Atlas Crane. Uh, the consideration of a wide range of, of programming. So um, uh, winter, summer, seasonality is something that the team has been working on, as well as the ongoing operations and maintenance of the park in the future. And again, uh, thinking about that, uh, that dynamism and, and the resilience that's necessary, necessary in a landscape uh, like this, the landscape that we're creating. So with that, I will pass the presentation over to Herm Sweeney from Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates and Emily mueller DeSellis. They'll take you through. It's a double presentation this afternoon, so I think we're on until 3 o'clock, a double header, so lots of parks material to go through. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Herb, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, everyone. Okay. Um, Leon, can I share the presentation from my screen for this one? Yes, you can. OK, great. And I'm going to put myself a uh, video on hold because I've had some connectivity issues and I don't want to see that happen. Um, so apologize for that. OK, and then hopefully uh, we're good to go. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yeah, we got it. Hey, can you still see it? It's full screen now. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon. Um, so uh, it's, I guess it's a little unfortunate that we're not all in the boardroom today, uh, but we're still quite excited to share you guys with you guys some of the updates um, that we're bringing today. Um, so for over 14 years, MVVA has been working to realize the design vision, um, reconnecting the Don River Valley to the harbor. There have been three primary goals that we've outlined, flood protection, number one, uh, second was naturalization, and third was placemaking. And today we're here to review the 27 acres of parks uh, that consist of the Promontory Park South, the River Valley Park North, and the River Valley Park South. And we've received a lot of really great comments and feedback over this entire process. Um, some of you know the, the most recent conversations with the DRP, um, there were questions about considering future conditions, um, about studying event programming and better understanding the park operations, as well as um, creating an inventive biodiverse and daring planting strategy. And I think the feedback has been um, fantastic and we've taken all that and continued to progress the design. Um, looking back historically, um, really the last time we presented to you all the River Valley Park North and South parts of the project, that was two years ago. Um, it's kind of hard to believe. You've seen uh, kind of along the periphery of uh, River Valley, the naturalized um, part of the project, you've seen some advancement in the, the parks above top of the bank, um, but we haven't really talked to, about it. Um, and then most recently, um, back in February, we had the chance to update you all on some of the big changes, the moves with Promontory Park South. So um, what's here on the screen is where we are today. And um, in looking at this plan, there's a few updates to the design that are kind of important to point out at a high level. The, the first would be relative to Promontory Park South. So one of the advancements is that we've um, taken the future destination play slash park amenity pavilion and relocated it from the edge along uh, Trinity, future Trinity and Cherry Street and placed it in a more centralized location um, within the destination play, but also um, in relationship to Promontory Park South. Um, another notable change is in looking at the River Valley Park area 
Um, the dog off leash areas that were previously shown at the very southwest corner of uh, River Valley Park South along Polson Street and Cherry Street have now been um, split into two dog off leash areas, um, icons number nine on this diagram, and um, brought into River Valley Park North. Another um, major change was um, how the park responds to the fire hall building. And that's related to um, the current property acquisition that is underway to make that fire hall building uh, change from private ownership to uh, being owned by the city of Toronto. So in looking at the overall approach and strategy for the project, um, this is a massive uh, engineering project. It's got great complexity. The work is, um, there's a lot of work currently underway with uh, the river excavation and the cutoff wall barriers um, that follow uh, the river valley and really the kind of the solid line, the red line shown on this diagram. Um, we are, um, we've really sought to, to embrace um, industrial heritage of the, the project site. And that's through several different means of salvaging um, material from the Marine Terminal 35 building um, that was structurally compromised and, and needed to be demolished, um, all the way to relocating the Fire Hall 30 building that is currently within the right of way um, and preserving it and bringing it into the park. The relationship between um, the upland forest that, that frames the, the floodplain it's not only important to providing ecologically rich habitat um, for the river valley, but also in establishing the identity of the parks. Um, because the, we've noted the, the landscape is leading um, in any future development. And uh, it really will become, that forest frame will become the kind of the condition that holds what is gonna be a boundless space until that urban development comes along. Considering that the, the Portland's project is an enormous brownfield, uh, there will not be a single square meter of undisturbed soil um, when we begin the, the park finishes. And uh, the planting design needs to really consider how that sun-baked, um, windswept condition um, can, be, can be established. And, it plans for the forest frame and how through both natural succession, but also through um, working with the, the Parks and Forestry Recreation Department on kind of an adaptive management strategy to deliver that forest frame, um, not first year out, but thinking more of 10, 20, 30 years out into the future. The, the success of the plantings is highly dependent on soils. And there's been a monumental effort uh, to, to classify all the, the soils and the, the contaminants that are found within the soils and then find opportunities for reuse. And um, typically when existing soils, uh, project site soils are reused on the site, um, they require a, either in the event of the river valley, a half meter, um, clean soil cap or contact barrier as a risk management measure, or in the, the case of the parks, one and a half meter um, risk management measure. With the, with the creation of the, this natural system um, in the Portlands, this project will become Toronto's next great large urban park. And the MVBA team has continued to consider the, the comprehensive vision um, in addition to what it looks like on day one when we open in 2024. And part of that effort is making sure that we have this integrated network of paths and trails. And that, that goes from reconnecting the Lower Don Trail uh, to the harbor and through the River Valley Park South area, as well as um, providing these two main what we describe as hallway paths that become an organizing element for um, the parks programming. 
And given the kind of the, the large size of this project um, in general, the the parks can offer really an extraordinary uh, range of park programming types that don't currently exist within Toronto's waterfront. Um, and that, that goes from um, event lawns that have you know prominent skyline views um, to a playscape that we're intending to draw citywide users um, all the way to what we think is going to be a one completely unique situation of a barbecue picnics terrace that um, offers views out across this new river system. So in looking at the, the park features, um, it's important to think about how we orchestrate this into a complete ensemble. And what we'll talk through today is we'll, we'll go through um, beginning in Promontory Park South, some of those unique features like the event lawn and the promontory um, touch on how we've addressed Remember, uh, retaining the Atlas Crane, um, and then move to those unique features within the River Valley Park North and South system, such as those picnic areas I described and the dog off leash areas. But there's also this layer of kind of park wide features um, that we'll come back to at the end that are overarching and create that comprehensive um, park vision. So, with that, um, I'm going to let Emily uh, Mueller de Celis kind of take it from there. All right, Emily, are you on mute? Yes, I am. <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks for hi everyone. Um, so what we've been working on since we last um, met with you at the end of February is really starting to um, uh, look at the detailing and technical aspects of the design to make sure that we're able to um, create the kind of design vision that we discussed with you um, in February. Next slide, please. The, the focus of our work this um, past couple of months have really been on um, the scale and making sure that we have the right fit with everything um, that we're uh, proposing, the materials, as well as integration of the heritage pieces. Um, specifically for the event lawn, we've been really looking at um, what we need to do to make sure that it's viable for the types of programming that's um, needed as well as the, um, the event plaza and how that serves the event lawn. We've also been looking at the MT35 commemoration piece and how that gets integrated into the landscape. And then also just developing the overall material language of the promontory and um, how that also um, uh, is folded into the larger whole of, um, of the River Valley Park system as well. Next slide. So in terms of the event line, we've been working with a theater consultant um, looking at the logistics of um, having these types of events in the space and really starting to um, focus in on the kind of circulation that's needed, the logistics, the back of house, um, how you would set up the, um, the events, how you would move people through it, control the space, all of that. And that's really started to inform the overall scale of the lawn as well as the um, performance uh, plaza that's um, indicated in the northwest corner there, and how that would be um, uh, also just managed in terms of the overall events with concessions and services. Um, next slide. We've also been looking at the esplanade and um, what uh, is possible in terms of um, activating that space and having that, the views out to the harbor, um, but also understanding um, how we can create a, a place that has comfort to it as well, being on the edge and um, being exposed in the western um, sun. Um, but what we've but also been looking at is the kind of technical aspects of this and the existing um, uh, dock wall construction with the relieving platform and the limitations that we have in terms of planting. Um, and the, so that's really informed how we've approached planting at the um, at the park edge here to really create a robust landscape that brings the 
um, planting to the edge as, as close as possible. We also are proposing to have uh, materials here to indicate this is a very special space with the um, unit um, pavers, the um, paleotech pavers, and also looking at, at um, the, the seating so that um, we can provide um, a comfortable seating underneath the, the trees. Next slide. Another aspect that has um, come about is that as the um, MT35 building has been um, demolished, um, what's revealed is that the um, existing footing is actually integrated into the dock wall structure. And um, we saw this as an opportunity to kind of mark the overall extent of MT35 as a palimpsest, keeping the, the foundations um, which step up and step down. Um, and being able to manipulate that so that um, where we have uh, flush conditions, we weave paths in and through, and where it's stepped up, it gets embedded into plant beds so that you see and get a sense of the overall footprint of the building. Um, this is um, actually only going to be on the western and um, nor nor north and, and south sides. The um, eastern side, as you know, we are uh, proposing a huge amount of topography, so um, parts of that will get covered, but we're also revealing um, the piles that are holding up that foundation wall at the, um, the southeast corner um, in the Canoe Cove. Next slide. We've also been looking at this more closely with our structural engineer in terms of the um, footings and the fact that um, they go down as piles to bedrock and um, really starting to understand how we can uh, register the kind of size, uh, the scale and volume of the, the building. And we're proposing um, these uh, columns that start to uh, look at that kind of rhythm of the, of the uh, building facade um, and also seeing that as an opportunity to introduce um, lighting um, into that element so that it can be seen during the day and then also from afar at night. Next slide. So this um, view from the harbor um, promenade looking south uh, towards the islands um, shows you um, the kind of experience uh, of the of the, um, the site at this um, moment here with the um, elements of all of the MT35 um, heritage commemoration piece coming together with the columns, um, noting the um, signage that is on the facade now, but would be embedded in the ground uh, as a uh, uh, to register that aspect. Um, also um, introducing uh, seating, not only along the edge of the plant beds, but also um, midway within the uh, plaza. So that gives a feeling of um, flexibility and comfort in terms of choice and then um, views out into the harbor. Next slide. We've also been looking at the overall promontory and that kind of unfolded landscape that we discussed in, in February, how to start to think of the kind of material um, language of the, the walls. Um, and we've developed this so that the, we've got the two walls on the north and south um, east kind of holding the topography for allowing for those um, overlooks out into um, the Canoe Cove into the harbor uh, and downtown, um, but then also allowing for some spilling of the stone down to the west <clears throat> towards the um, esplanade as the um, stone spills down and creates a stone scramble to get up to the promenade. Um, and then having um, at the very high point, uh, the upper promontory, uh, um, a moment where you can have a 360 degree panoramic view of the whole site. Next slide. In terms of the stone materials, um, we're really looking at this language that comes out of the Canoe Cove and the West Cove um, with the armored stone and the riprap revetments coming up and out. Um, but then also overlaying um, other types of stone as well, um, glacial erratics that come out of um, the ground, as well as um, salvaged stone that we're finding on site that we're really seeing this as um, the overall um, material language. We also have um, 
selected the MSE um, wall um, type to be able to um, construct these walls. Um, partly that comes out of the existing conditions with the, um, the ground. And um, it allows us to do a, a two-stage um, construction where the first stage allows for surcharge and is flexible enough to um, move with the, the soil. And then the second stage is to add the um, a stone um, facing to it. But what we've also been looking at is um, the armor stone that we have already on site. We've gone to the quarries um, to really understand how to look at the armor stone in an innovative way and have seen that there's different types of bedding that happens in the quarry. And depending on where you are within that bedding, you can be a change of color or texture and size. And we were really interested in um, uh, exploring that and seeing how that can be revealed on this wall. Next slide. So um, what we've been um, developing in terms of the, the design of the walls is that we, with the stone facing, um, to have the, the stone really express the, that kind of layering and the kind of weight and forces of um, the, the earth that's being moved and surcharged, so that that becomes a, a part of the overall composition and um, abstraction of what the stone can do. Next slide. So this is an overall um, elevation that shows the kind of layering that, that we are um, proposing with uh, the, the darker um, stone, which is usually at the top of a bedding of a, a quarry, and then the, the buff stone at the middle, and then the red at the, at the base, and then the layering of the, um, the plants as, uh, along with the, um, the wall, is the, the stone as well. Um, it, this also shows that the kind of scale and size of the walls are still quite um, powerful, and that even though they have been lowered since the very beginning, um, we still feel that the three and a half to four meters will still have a, a really big impact. I talked to the nurse this Next slide. Uh, so I had some idea, and I gather. Um, and, uh, so uh, at this crane um, peninsula, um, we are um, uh, retaining the Atlas crane. Um, the <laughs> overall um, uh, layout that we are, are uh, and setting that we're putting it within is we are um, bringing park paths in and through groves of trees at the uh, base of the Atlas Crane so that you can see it from afar and then as you approach it, it's embedded. But then once you go inside um, and underneath the crane, it's this found space. Um, we are registering the existing um, concrete uh, slab that is um, that was used for storage area. And uh, the park paths come up to and um, uh, score that that edge. Um, we are also um, locating the uh, spreader beam that's part of the uh, the Atlas crane in that space. So um, once you um, enter into that space, it really has this kind of interiority to it. While you have all of the other park um, features um, surrounding it as well. Next slide. The Atlas Crane um, stabilization, uh, we've been um, looking at this um, with our structural engineers as well. And um, because the existing condition is that it's a um, uh, uh, held uh, through friction uh, with the cabling system, we do have to stabilize it and um, introduce um, uh, steel tie beams at the very top and take some of the cables down, not all of them. Um, so that we'll be able to have a register of what the um, original kind of functioning of that crane uh, used to be. We are also proposing to enclose the base of these um, masts so that it would prevent people from climbing up the, the crane, but also um, just enclosing the, 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 the um, uh, edges below. Um, the hoist house that is shown here um, is also slated for demolition. Um, and uh, that is a, a complete uh, package in terms of all of the work that's being done um, on the, the crane. Um, the uh, enclosure piece at the, at the bottom um, really is um, keeping uh, the people, the, the, the public um, away from being able to access the crane. Next slide. All right, so um, we, we've discussed 
in previous um, design review panel presentations, the relationship with these uh, entry points into the parks, both on the west side and the east side of Cherry Street. And um, the west side is envisioned as more of an entry plaza, something that is civic in scale. Um, it promotes really the west side of the street as being a main entry point into the park. And more importantly, because Promontory Park South is the, the more intensely uh, used or anticipated to be intensely used based on the programming types. Um, so here that entry plaza uh, has park benches and bike racks and wayfinding and signage to direct you into and through the parks. Um, it's also immediately off of that Lower Don Trail, which is uh, west loaded on Cherry Street. Um, looking at the east side of Cherry Street, um, this, this entry really is intended to um, pull the forest frame um, up to the edge of the right of way um, and provide some landscape buffer um, from the expansive nature of that intersection and, and the sounds and kind of the the visual qualities and provide relief to that new naturalized river valley um, portion of the park. With that said, we've introduced some new uh, points of connection, some new paths that uh, have a more direct relationship, pulling you in off of the corner um, and adding some porosity here. The west side of that entry plaza um, abuts right up to the, the destination play area. Um, we will be talking about that in an upcoming DRP session, um, so I won't go any further into that. But what's important to note about the edge of that destination play area is that we've also uh, increased the porosity along that urban edge of future Trinity Street. Um, so in this view, in the, the distance at the end of the street, you can see one of those new paths that um, goes and splits through the destination play area and connects back to the event lawn and that circulation diagram that Emily showed um, for programming the event lawn. And we've added uh, a more generous um, opening to a civic scale plaza uh, associated with a future washroom and uh, potentially cafe or um, uh, park camp type pavilion off um, right off of the, the street. The, the idea is that um, though the pavilion is centrally located within the uh, destination play area, it also becomes um, really kind of a, a attractor, um, a destination for all park users. So along the Trinity Boulevard and the, the Woonerf, um, we're envisioning lay-by areas for both uh, pickup and drop-off of park users, potentially those bringing canoes or kayaks, um, in addition to school groups or camps that might be being dropped off by bus um, to use the pavilion or other areas of the park. And as we move into River Valley Park North, um, we've this diagram starts to talk to the increase of connections and that porosity and how we've reinforced the, the relationship of the street edge to the park and, and um, provided additional moments such as um, these quick get downstairs at the end of um, the bridges as creating more of an integrated bridge to park experience instead of having your make your way all the way down to the main entry um, plazas along Cherry Street. This is a, a view that gives you a sense of that landscape buffer and the layering that it creates between the River Valley, um, which is opening up kind of at the end of this path onto the, the main hallway path, um, and the street would be behind you. Um, porosity at the Commissioner Street Edge has also been an area that we focused on, and um, we've tried to really invite the community into the park and provide more opportunities to do so. Um, one of the, the advancements is a focused entry plaza alongside the Fire Hall 30 building. Now that that's moved from being private to um, public or is moving from public to private ownership. And the, the generosity of that plaza um, as a scale um, is one of the important reasons why the, the repositioning of this fire hall um, 30 and, and shifting inward and becoming a park amenity 
um, is, is a change that we've advanced um, as far as the design goes. On the north and east sides of that Fire Hall 30 building, we've created that the bigger generous plaza um, and then a more intimately scaled down space on the, the west side that relates back to the nature play areas. Um, as part of the, the uh, 2024 phase of this project, we're delivering washrooms um, at the south end of this building. And it's envisioned that as um, the building is fit out over future phases of work um, that it could have amenities such as uh, a cafe or community rooms on the ground floor. Um, and then that the upper floors could service uh, PFNR for um, uh, staff uh, facilities. Um, and then in, with the addition of uh, PFNR using this for staff, um, we have provided some, a small area of parking um, off the edge of that main hallway path for those that come to use and service that building. This uh, view looking south to the face of the building shows what the future fit out um, could be with improvements such as removing the existing brick infill panel uh, that had uh, uh, filled the previous opening uh, for vehicles entering into the fire hall with a new storefront or type of glazing frontage. Um, and the idea that the pavement from the street spills into the plaza of areas of movement, um, but that a um, brick pavement um, suggests areas of collection along the edges. Um, these, there would be opportunities to bring cafe seating out into those areas, um, and that would service both um, future uses of that ground floor um, by whether it's a ice cream shop or a coffee shop, in addition to if there were community room spaces and PFNR chooses to use this to queue up camps and other activities uh, programming that they kind of run out of this building. Um, in looking at the, the, the dog off leash areas, one of the design advancements has been to uh, provide two locations instead of a single one and bringing those locations um, up to River Valley Park North um, connecting them very closely to the sidewalk so they have a more direct relationship with the public realm and collecting users at the front door of the park. Um, they're located you know, in a short distance uh, right off the intersection, so a minute walk over to Cherry Street, um, a five minute walk across uh, the Commissioner Street Bridge to the future um, film studio district to the east side, and then um, directly off a few of the crosswalks that go back up to uh, the Villiers Precinct to the north. The, the materiality of those dog off leash areas um, will be taking cues from the, the pilot projects that um, PFNR is uh, currently um, pursuing um, related to having an artificial turf type within them. Uh, there's the potential that we bring some of that um, concrete pavement down to provide accessible surfaces along the perimeter of those areas. And then it's just worth noting that we continue to reinforce that we're, we're looking to keep dog users out on the kind of the periphery of the park. And it, when they do make their way into the park, that we have um, range fence that is introduced along that entire hallway path to deter users from moving down into the habitat that's within the river valley. Um, inscribed within the, the forest frame, we're envisioning a playscape that is nature based and really is unlike any playscape that's currently found in Toronto. Um, so we have uh, from, from a concept diagram, the, the western edge of the playscape we're describing as Cableway Canyon. The center part is the Green Giant Forest. And then the, the southern part is the Badland Scramble. And um, the these are all very exciting spaces unique to um, themselves within this larger composition. And beginning with the Cableway Canyon, we're um, imagining this as a kind of really the, the one of the most exciting active kinetic play scapes in all of Toronto with um, a fitness loop. But in addition to that fitness loop, having these large gated cableways um, uh, being the first to have a cableway really in Toronto, but having two of these is probably 
uh, unique to anywhere in the world at this point. Um, and those cableways are embedded within that forest frame, um, having uh, we'll have poured in place play surfaces underneath the cableways. We'll have engineered fiber, wood fiber as the um, fall attenuation surface in the, the fitness areas. Um, off uh, at the right hand side of this diagram um, is another unique play element, a to and fro swing. So um, it's a, a thickened rope uh, a beam at the bottom that uh, is suspended and it takes kind of kids working together to activate and use it. Um, really kind of encouraging kids um, full range of kind of active play in this area. The, the Green Giant Forest takes on a character that's a little more imaginative, a little more quiet um, and narrative based. There is at the center of it um, and at the high point of the nature play area, a series of these forest swings that um, you could be swinging with views looking back to the city skyline on the other swing. Um, you could be looking down across the river valley. It has this wonderful prospect to it. Um, but in some of those quieter, more imaginative places, um, uh, such as the, this one to the left of the screen, um, there's a series of these upside down dried trees that become pole climbers and um, suggest something kind of fantasy like and very surprising and unreal. Um, but also having little areas within that zone that kids can collect and gather and make believe and, and kind of story tell whether they're these wood thrones or little round tables that they can have kind of tea time in. Um, on the very east end of this area sits um, an eight meter tall snowy owl um, that is resting within a nest that's embedded in the topography of the landscape. Um, very similar to the natural habitat of where the snowy owls would be found in the wild. Um, at the bottom of this large wood structure is the stage that allows for uh, a totally different type of play, um, something very imaginative. Um, and it will be something iconic and memorable, um, sitting really off, off that main fire hall entry. So one of the first things that you see when, and you're greeted to when you arrive into the park. The, the last area of the, the nature play um, portion of the project is the Badland Scramble. And this, this is another truly unique feature. Um, it focuses a lot on water play and sand play, um, but in a, a very unique way, um, unlike anything that's really been done in Toronto. Um, it draws a, a little bit of references to some of the, the more kind of uh, uh, creative play of one of the parks where kids can get out and just dig and create little runnels and have water run down it, but it's it's in a, a larger type of scale. And um, the at the large sand area down at the bottom, um, we're also proposing a uh, wood log structure described as the beaver dam. In the big open sand area, we're gonna make sure that there's some shade structures um, to protect kind of the, the younger user group that might be down in that area, staying more um, focused on that area of play. But the, the whole Badland Scramble is envisioned as kind of a range of uh, skills and, and challenges. And it grad, you graduate up from kind of the more passive sand area to um, uh, this area of the scrambles, which were um, kind of referencing and abstracting the geological formation of the Cheltenham Badlands just outside of um, the GTA. And it was an area, uh, a natural, um, natural formation that used to be accessible. And um, we've certainly heard many stories of people taking their kids out there and how wonderful it was to spend a day climbing and scrambling. Um, it's been eroded with the high usage and demand on that. And the idea is we can provide something experientially that gives you that, that same value of play um, within the city setting that won't um, compromise uh, a natural condition. Um, we're looking at uh, how to form those features, um, exploring kind of a, a, a shot creep uh, technology or approach using um, concrete to create the uh, undulations, having sand um, down in the valleys and really uh, larger areas down at the base of it, 
And then introducing water on the upper portions. So you get these runnels, these streams that flow down and you can imagine kids taking buckets of sand, bringing them up um, to the top of the little valley system and building dams and watching it flow downstream and into the bottom of this area. Um, at, the, at the east end of uh, the River Valley Park North area, so um, immediately off of the signalized intersection of Munition Street is where we have that large picnic terrace and picnic, picnic lawn um, spaces. And this is um, uh, quite exciting because we feel that we have about the capacity for 300 or so people um, to come out and have seating within these picnic groves, these picnic terraces. And within each of these terraces would be um, uh, picnic tables that are quite ordinary in nature, but really composed in a unique way that promotes flexibility and, and community. Um, you could imagine that um, groups of family and friends would come and occupy five or six of these tables that are banked all together. It might be that there's a, there's five or six different people that don't know each other, but in, in um, inspires kind of a more community setting of occupying space, though there are tables set away from others. Um, but the, one of the big draws of just a large amount of picnic areas is that we're providing these um, barbecue grill stations where there's three of these charcoal grills um, in a cluster um, in close proximity to those tables that you can come out and, and, and be able to grill whatever food you're, you have, whether it's hot dogs or hamburgers or something totally different, um, and then take them back to your seating areas. And the in one of these pods, we've brought some of the, the play out of the nature play and introduced um, another play element, the reaching raccoon, another big wood structure um, where which would have a small kind of younger age children type slide, but just something that allows um, people that are cooking some time to linger, families to stay a bit longer and have your kids go stay a bit occupied before you head back over um, to the, the nature play area. Or it, this becomes a feature that really makes uh, the experience of the park something that you come out for the entire day. You go to the Promontory Park South um, event lawn or you go to the destination play area and then you come out here for lunch and then you go down into the river valley system. It allows some more staying power. The, the porosity of the future Polson Street edge is also something that we've looked at quite a bit. and. Um, one of the, the challenges was how to provide um, that quick, fast route of the Lower Don Trail and avoid conflicts um, with bring, bringing pedestrians into the park. Um, and in doing so, we looked at um, elevating the Lower Don Trail. So the Lower Don Trail rises in elevation to these points of crossing and then creating a, a very unique and powerful entry experience of, of really crossing the threshold underneath these bridges. And then um, after you move through that compression, being released into some views going out into the river um, and out into kind of up into the trail network of the forest frame. Um, the, the materiality is very similar to others area of the park, other areas of the park. We have asphalt paths. Um, we have uh, these big, large plant beds, and at those entry points, having the, the trash and, and recycling receptacles as well as wayfinding. Um, the bridge details themselves uh, take cues from the, the River Valley bridges, um, so wood decking, um, having the same extend mesh kind of guardrail detailing of the bridges that are down in the River Valley but um, they start to reference the industrial heritage of the uplands. And uh, here is where we've used some of those, um, those salvaged and repurposed those girders for the MT35 building um, to help uh, create the guardrail conditions for the bridges. So with that, um, I'm gonna let Emily talk through the park-wide components. So we have been, I'm good. Uh, we've been looking at the overall. Hmm, I'm getting a lot of feedback. I'm going to turn off my my camera. Herb, do you want to mute? Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Thanks. Um, we have been uh, looking at the um, 
material language across the park as well and all the systems that go across both River Valley Park North, South and, Humber and um, Promontory Park South. Um, and so um, one aspect of that is the gathering spaces and um, those are these moments that are um, embedded within the, the overall design of the park. Um, in terms of thinking about the materiality of that and how to start to look at the scale of the spaces, we were really intrigued and found um, these um, log jam um, references as something to, that um, kind of starts to create the design vision for these locations. Um, so um, what we also have been doing is doing mock-ups in um, the uh, spaces outside of our offices and seeing how these types of um, elements can play out and be um, quite playful in, in the way that they start to define space and for, for gathering. Next slide. So the overall gathering spaces, um, we have um, three uh, that are in the River Valley parks that uh, are um, associated with the two main hallway paths that the main paths that um, uh, are on either side of the floodplain and that look out onto the river and the um, the those type those gathering spaces have uh, wood in them while we have the other um, uh, overlooks and gathering areas in uh, a promontory park south the ones down by the canoe cove um, also have some wood and stone with them as well as um, the promontory park sorry the promontory overlooks uh, with the stone as described um, before. Next slide. So in terms of the gathering um, spaces, these are spaces that we are um, uh, proposing that um, have um, enough scale to them that um, it could be used for um, large gatherings of people. Um, something like an eco classroom could gather here um, before they head out down into the floodplain. Um, but the idea also is to kind of break down the scale of the space and have multiple um, alcoves in a sense so that um, many different um, groups could, could gather at the same time. Also thinking about the composition of it, uh, of the um, uh, kind of log jams as, as they are um, embedded into these gathering areas with the flow of the, the um, log jams that they start to provide these moments of, of um, uh, enclosure and um, more intimate spaces within. Um, also, the um, kind of playfulness of them is something that we're really interested in. Um, the different types of, of um, wood that we are proposing, um, we've been talking a lot with the Parks Department in terms of seeing what they can salvage from their, their typical maintenance and operations and looking at um, a range of different types of seating, whether it's logs that are cut off um, so that they're um, have a, a flat top to them or um, rounded logs and then um, the wood edging of the spaces that are, um, contain the limestone screenings that are within the, the gathering areas and then also proposing in certain um, uh, areas to have um, uh, these logs that are actually become pavers in the in the ground. Um, we have also been looking at um, the art trail and um, really seeing uh, the park um, these parks as a platform for art and planning for um, that to be curated by by others. Um, next slide. The um, the idea is that we have been working um, with uh, Waterfront Toronto to start to identify locations for art um, based on a theme of the river and creating these art walks that are um, are, uh, would be curated by um, other entities that would um, be using uh, um, the, these, these locations. But the idea is that we would have a, um, a, a range of different spaces from permanent um, art spaces to temporary, um, and then also um, some temporary ones down in the floodplain as well. What we are doing within this project um, is that we're providing the infrastructure for that um, to happen in the future. So uh, we've been uh, working on making sure that certain areas have water and electricity and um, uh, potential data, um, but then also acknowledging there are some areas that might not have that kind of infrastructure because they're down within the floodplain. 
but um, this sets it up so that um, others can um, uh, be able to throw um, those kinds of of um, kind of platforms for art in in this location. Next slide. Um, we are also looking at um, the different types of um, spaces that are needed for permanent versus um, temporal. Um, the permanent ones, uh, that those kinds of settings in terms of what it's going to be like um, as a, a um, permanent piece within the landscape in the future, but then also the temporary in terms of how to embed that within an existing space that um, is, can be programmed um, either for those kinds of eco classrooms that I was talking about before, or that you can also have moments where art can um, be introduced into the spaces as well. Um, the benches <clears throat> and seating locations, um, we have been looking at a variety of different types of seating throughout the parks, um, ranging from the more typical civic backed benches um, to the log benches that have um, referenced already to uh, more like timber benches as well. Um, next slide. The um, benches that we are proposing are a uh, Gen 50 bench that um, uh, is at the upper uh, left hand of the slide here. Um, that, that would be the typical park bench that's found on the hallway and um, the, the main park paths. Um, the, um, the timber bench um, to, the, to the right um, we are proposing those that is a, a reclaimed um, timber that um, we are proposing along the edge of the esplanade. And then the um, more kind of rustic um, seating associated with the logs that um, described before with the gathering areas. We're also looking at um, using um, the a very typical park bench and uh, sorry, um, a picnic bench. The, uh, a, 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 unusual and unique way, the way that um, Herb described that it's more about the kind of um, collection of those benches and um, uh, being able to create community. Also looking at how stone can be used for seating in ways that are more casual in terms of um, the glacial erratics or in terms of stacked stone that um, allows for um, some uh, larger gatherings. Also uh, have been developing park fencing and barriers and um, the idea behind this actually is really so that the fencing can um, protect the planting and allow for it to grow and also cue people in terms of where they should be um, occupying um, the, the lawns and the areas versus the plant beds. And there's a quite a large range that we're showing here, but the idea is that some of this is permanent and then other is more um, transitory in, in that it gives the Parks Department a tool to be able to work with um, the public and um, uh, be able to have temporary fencing that you would have up at the beginning. And then as the planting um, gets established, it would uh, go away. Next slide. So um, we are proposing the range fence, um, which is a black locust log um, um, posts uh, with uh, wire, galvanized wire. Um, these, this type of fencing has been very successful in that it allows for kind of transparency so you don't feel like you are up next to a fence. And it allows for the planting to come through, but it also gives you cues as to where you, um, you're supposed to be um, on the path rather than in the plant beds. Um, so it, it helps to protect the, the planting. Next slide. Um, also um, thinking about the um, kind of uh, temporary type uh, fencing, like the um, snow fencing at the lower left-hand corner, um, which is made of, of um, cedar. And the idea is that that really is uh, deployed at um, the beginning of the project to start to define where um, uh, planting needs to be protected, and then that could go away over time. The um, fencing at the lower right, um, sorry, um, is uh, more of a permanent fencing that still is quite transparent, but that would be used for the play areas to allow for um, real protection of, of the um, planting as well as um, 
moments for people to be able to lean on it and as they're sitting and watching their, their children play. Next slide. The typical um, uh, PFNR um, fencing for the DOLA, we've um, been looking at the guidelines that they have there. Um, looking also at introducing an, another kind of railing within the nature play area to protect the um, planting from the children as they're um, running around in those, those areas and keep them um, on, on the paths that they need to, to be on. And then also the guardrails um, at the top of the promontory, um, similar to the um, fish gate uh, bridges in the uh, floodplain as well as the bike bridges having extend mesh and similar type of detailing in, in, um, in that uh, location as well. Lighting strategy, um, although it looks pretty complicated here with a lot of different types and, and colors of dots, we actually have a very simple strategy where um, we have two different types of lighting fixtures and conditions um, and uh, one wooden uh, pole just at different scales. And the idea is that the lighting really um, plays a background role that in terms of the fixtures and that it starts to blend into the forest frame and illuminates the, um, the area in more of an ambient light um, condition. The one location that's different is along the Esplanade where we have the MT35 um, commemorations uh, uh, columns that will be illuminated as well as the kick rail along the edge um, that needs to contribute to the lighting in that area as well to create um, a um, consistent um, illumination of that surface. Next slide. So um, in terms of the different, um, uh, the two different types of, of lighting poles that we have, um, we have the smaller ones that are along the park paths and then the larger ones that are associated just for the um, event lawns and would have multiple um, lighting uh, attached to it. Next slide. We've also been developing the wayfinding and signage strategy um, uh, based on the um, current um, parks um, uh, PFNR guidelines that, and pilot project that they have been developing. Um, we have also been thinking about that, striking that balance in terms of being able to create wayfinding and orientation. Um, while also and, and um, giving information um, with um, uh, the, the different um, parts of the park, but not creating a condition that has too much signage that it just becomes um, a clutter. Next slide, please. So we have um, whittled down the um, 17 different um, types of signage that the Parks Department has within their overall um, guidelines to uh, four um, signs that um, feel appropriate for the uh, Portland's project. We also have been working with the Parks Department in terms of modifying these so that they can um, uh, be um, more responsive to this site. So the entry signs with the Portland's um, Park, as you see on the right, um, finger pointers that will really orient you and be able to have a, a sense of where you are within the forest frame, and then area um, signage for um, localized areas. Next slide. We also are looking at um, what we're calling Parks Plus, which is another layer of signage that um, introduces more of an interpretive aspect to it and orientation. So at the entrances of the park, we would have tactile maps that are accessible. Um, also, um, in key locations, um, uh, compasses on the ground, um, painted on the ground that orient you within the park, but then also to um, other areas with um, the larger context to orient you within the Toronto area. In terms of pavement materials, we've um, also been looking at um, this being a, a quite um, frugal approach. Um, all of the uh, general park paths are um, bituminous concrete and that they take you through the park and are really background. But then there are moments that are highlighted for special um, uh, conditions such as the Fire Hall 30 Plaza or the um, Esplanade 
So that those are the moments where uh, they're more civic in nature that will bring people together. Um, also with the, um, the uh, areas of the gathering places, having more of a kind of um, uh, rustic uh, approach with limestone screenings. This is the um, overall kind of uh, pavement type set uh, you've seen, um, ranging from the asphalt to concrete to limestone screen screenings, um, the um, paleotech uh, and play surfacing that we need, um, as well as wood deck and um, brick that we're um, proposing for Fire Hall 3. I've also been looking at the snow removal locations with um, the Parks Department. Um, we've really only identified the main um, uh, access into the um, park to service uh, the uh, Fire Hall 30 and the future pavilion in uh, the destination play area. That's really all that the um, Parks Department has required of us to uh, propose, but this gives them the flexibility that as they see how the park is used, that they will be um, most likely having snow removal on other um, other paths. And we've accommodated that in terms of the dimensions of those paths. Stormwater management infrastructure uh, follows the EA um, recommend, uh, uh, requirements with all of the water um, filtering through and um, uh, outletting into the, the river and um, the uh, the harbor um, on the north side um, some of the water is collected in pipes that then is um, directed to one outfall in the canoe cove and that goes out into the slip um, on the south side there's overland flow that just um, goes out into the, the the river there's no need for um, for pipes in that area servicing access routes have been our um, uh, we've uh, had loops uh, here with the uh, main paths, making sure that um, the um, access is very clear and um, easy to be understood. And um, the only areas where we have some constrictions are underneath the bridges. And so we have introduced these loops so that access from the park, um, uh, from each of the park, uh, from the, the roads that it's possible to access to um, service the, the parks. Next slide. All right, All right. so um, we have two final sections and we're running short on time. So one of the things we've been certainly looking forward many years is about what happens when this project is handed off. And um, we've been working with uh, the city to help define potential locations for a temporary operations and maintenance facility, um, as well as what's uh, anticipated in the full vision. And um, the, the ideal location in the full vision is to have a larger O&M facility paired up with the sediment and debris management area that will be delivered at you know, the, the back end of the, this project, if not um, a little bit later down the road. Um, and we've been accommodating space in that location as well as looking at opportunities in these temporary locations that can provide service to the park. Um, we've certainly been thinking about how that handoff occurs and um, in doing so, we prepared an operations and maintenance uh, manual. It's organized into an overall strategy that is, is comprehensive between both uh, the parks and the uplands, as well as down within the floodplain, um, and how to kind of uh, describe both of those systems and then look at those as individual systems themselves. Um, one of the, the, the ways in kind of setting up that framework for management is to think about the parks as far as fixed assets that, that could be things such as structures like the cart gates um, or the esplanade to things that are more episodic. Um, easy to understand that flood events are something to plan for down in the river, but um, in the uplands, it could be a uh, programming, it could be permitted events and then um, adaptively managed assets. And that, that could include kind of the vegetation and the plant systems and thinking about how those will evolve. So with those fixed assets, that's fairly straightforward and the agencies have a pretty good understanding of that. Um, however, there are unique materials, there are unique components to the project. 
Um, we've tried to make things digestible. It's not a you go out and you mow every um, third day kind of manual. It's really trying to set what the vision is and um, give them kind of maintenance drivers and things to look for when they're monitoring these components. Um, those episodic events, we've certainly been talking a lot about them and how we plan for them, how we plan for a big event and event lawn. Um, and part of what we want to uh, provide uh, the Parks Department is what happens after you know, those events and what do they need to plan for and, and how can we make the landscape resilient and make clear what those protective measures are that the design team has considered. The adaptively management managed assets are, are you know quite unique and that that's a really um, different story on how we um, explain and, and pass along that information. I mean part of it is making sure that the the design vision is understood. So um, in this example, it's just describing that the submergent marsh and the, the design vision in the bottom right is that you have partial coverage uh, of lily pads and there's open water. Um, trying to provide that, and it's one of the things that with the operations maintenance manual that we provided for Corktown Common, um, we received some, some fantastic input um, from PFNR and those that have been had boots on the ground trying to manage that system and we're we're taking those lessons learned and trying to bring them into this manual. The the part that we've talked about kind of many times about how we're gonna do this adaptive management strategy of the park, that's that is something unique to the parks department. Um, it's uh, an operation that the uh, the TRCA is quite well versed at um, and that our kind of narrative is more of just reaffirming the, the steps that they would take to um, continue to set the trajectory for that system. The, the parks and the uplands, um, we're borrowing on some of those uh, strategies that TRCA has been deploying um, and working closely with PFNR on how to lay out a framework that they can follow and manage. Um, and understanding that we need to remain flexible. It's, it is a dynamic system. Um, so looking at you know, those first couple of years of establishment and at various moments, what should the staff be looking for to address? And this example is just thinking about, okay, if uh, we give, we know that we're gonna start shading out the, the, the ground plane um, and as those sunshade conditions change, um, that they're going to have to start to consider um, infilling in areas that become bare. And how do you do that? Um, when do you do that? And what plant material are we proposing that they would consider doing that with? And starting to uh, provide the tools for PFNR to plan for you know, five, ten years down the road so they have the budget to adapt, adapt and, and uh, modify these systems as they continue to evolve. And then part of that is also not just from kind of the, the habitat perspective and, and then the vegetation and what it what it wants to grow and to be at, but also how do we want um, people to experience the parks and um, that there will be moments where um, view sheds will need to be opened up or that it's that area should be open and, and more of a frame view than a filtered view. And trying to provide some guidelines is an important part about um, how we're planting that forest frame. And with that, um, Emily will talk about this last section. So um, in terms of starting in on the planting design, obviously, um, as Herb has uh, described earlier, this is a pretty um, harsh site in terms of its exposure that it won't have a drop of soil on it um, until we bring it in in terms of a horticultural soil. Um, we'll have a lot of other kind of soil there. <laughs> um, but um, we have to set up the, the, the kind of conditions to create that um, kind of uh, layered um, plant communities and ecologies that we are um, proposing to see here. Um, there's obviously the existing um, conditions of wind and sun exposure, but with our topography and the way that we've designed the um, the, the grading here, um, we've started to think about how to create sheltered spaces, um, also thinking about water and how it moves through 
um, topographic relief like this. And so that's really become the, the, the basis for how we started to um, de design the, um, the forest frame. Next slide. You've all seen this uh, many times. We are working with the park planting types, um, ranging from the groves to the glades to the hedgerow, the gardens, the lawn, and the mixed forest. Um, we've deployed that throughout here um, in this um, diagram that many of you've seen before as well. Uh, this is a kind of full vision now of bringing the two parks together, um, linked, um, bringing in the um, forest um, frame as it comes into Promontory Park South, and then the kind of different types of layers within that forest frame. What we've also been developing is thinking about the kind of ecological narrative of the park as well. Um, similar to, you know, there, there's been a lot of research that was done in the floodplain in terms of analog sites. We've been doing the same for the uplands. And although these vegetation communities are reference Ontario an, on, um, analogs um, with comparable ecological conditions that we're setting up, um, they're not directly uh, reproduced on site, but instead um, they're references that are translated to adapt to the site and the urban conditions. And so this starts to talk about where those those types of um, analogs would be located as you move through and it starts to build up this kind of narrative for the uplands of the the the, um, the, the project. Next slide. And the program in ecology, it's really a mix. That it's that balance of um, creating these um, ecological conditions so that it can have that kind of richness of ecology. And then also um, bringing in the park program and how the two work together and, and creating these really um, kind of uh, magical moments uh, within the, the, the planting design that brings those two to uh, a kind of condition where it's just a joy to be in. Next slide. So um, this is this creates these moments throughout the the um, forest frame, and this is a pretty <laughs> um, layered diagram that talks about the different types of planting moments that are embedded within those kind of six different for uh, uh, planting types that we are proposing. Everything ranging from you know the the hedgerow spine. Um, to the entrance tunnel. Uh, so um, these kinds of um, uh, collages that we have here are really kind of inspirational in terms of showing what the kind of experience would be. It's more about um, uh, expressing the, the experiential quality of these types of planting um, communities that we're proposing. So ranging from the entrance tunnel to bosques to um, uh, crane grove, the larch lawn, Catalpa Promontory, Island Thickets. Um, it's just a, a, a rich range in terms of thinking about the different types of planting that, um, that's within Promontory Park. And then within the River Valley Parks, um, having the uh, general basis is that mixed forest and hedgerow, but then also having these amazing moments of, um, of wonder, especially within the nature play area, um, playing on the idea of the kind of fantasy of of that space, but then also um, thinking about the different kinds of, of um, moments within the uh, the picnic grove and um, the uh, the other areas within the River Valley parks. Next slide. So this starts the, um, to kind of structure the way that we're seeing the vision of the park. So coming off of the um, center, center Street into a more civic space with a high limbed um, uh, uh, canopy that has you look out onto the, um, the esplanade with the willows um, in the background. Next slide. Uh, or the kind of richness of seasonality that the larches, um, the grove of larches bring into it um, in this fall um, condition. In the spring condition of the entrance off of Cherry Street, looking over to the crane and really being embedded within an explosion of color. 
And then in the winter, um, having the structure of the forest frame around you and having um, the ground plane revealed and all of the, um, the, the, the river beyond. And so um, we always seem to end on this image, but it's such a powerful one for us because it really does bring this idea of the forest frame coming down from the ravine system out into the um, the mouth of, of the river uh, of, and the harbor beyond. Okay, so I, I think that that's all of our slides for today. Thank you. Oh, oh I think you're muted. That was great. Thanks, guys. There you go. How's that? Yes, better. Okay. Thank you very much for a comprehensive presentation. It's fantastic. Um, so we're going to move to questions of the panel, and I'll just go down the list. And I can see Betsy is all ready to go. So we'll start with Betsy. <laughs> I think oh, you're Betsy, muted. You're muted. Yeah. No, you're still muted, Betsy. Okay, I think I'm go. unmuted there now. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, my first question is relatively broad, and I'm I'm just kind of reading my notes uh, on my other screens while I'm looking at this. The um, it's clearly a park that's going to be full of people, and that's really exciting. And I think that the spaces for people are really well balanced against the spaces that are um, part of the uh, natural and sustainable and resiliency uh, aspects of the park. How did you kind of look at the demographic ranges designing these play spaces? In particular, I'm looking at areas where um, two groups, there's the tween group, particularly tween girls and um, older teens, um, two very different demographic groups that are kind of not in the little kid play space world. They're not in the sitting at benches watching little kids play space world. Um, they, uh, the older teens kind of need to be able to be rambunctious and make a lot of noise without it, them feeling like they're infringing on little kid play spaces and the tween zones, particularly tween girls. Um, and this is coming, stemming from a study that I read about the analysis of some parks in Vienna, um, where they kind of want d very different kinds of gathering spots and spaces to make them feel comfortable. Um, you clearly have a wide variety of playscapes. And so I guess the, the, the broad question is, did you identify this as a park more for little kids, little kids and caregivers? Do you think there's this flexibility where these other demographic groups that really aren't planned for a lot of the time can come in and feel really comfortable? Emily, do you want to talk to this one? Um, uh, sure. Yeah, I can talk to this one. Um, yeah, you know, we have done a huge amount of research on this subject um, um, as we've been designing parks of uh, play spaces over the years and really trying to understand how to make sure that we are creating spaces not just a, about, you know, active play or um, or play for um, for smaller kids, but that it really does get the full range of, of ages. Um, and so um, many of our designs, and we, and we have embedded it in here as well, um, do, do um, accommodate that. Um, and that's part of the range of how, um, in terms of the nature play area, we have it broken up into three different um, uh, kind of garden spaces with the kind of active, um, with the, the um, uh, cable way and the, um, uh, yeah, thanks for getting back to that. Um, the cable way as well as the uh, uh, exercise um, components. But then there are those moments of quiet um, off the beaten path areas that um, are for the kids that, that, that might wanna be on the edge and looking out and, and thinking about other ways of play, and that's part of that that imaginary and um, imaginative and um, uh, narrative play that uh, Herb had discussed as well. Um, we also were thinking that for the um, the the owl, um, 
that being kind of imaginative play, um, it being a theater and uh, more of a kind of uh, quieter area, um, that in juxtaposition to the swings that are up above, they're within view, but you can have a choice and whether you want to go and be part of that active condition or whether you want to um, be separate. I think that the major thing that we have um, uh, been always trying to provide is a choice and also views through so that um, kids can have that their, their own independence that they can make those decisions if they want to go to the, um, the area that's more active or passive depending on where you are in in what you're looking for because even kids uh, whether you know they have they go through um, even when they're there for one day they'll go through many different kinds of moods and might be wanting to be really engaged at one moment and not so much in another so uh, we've really embedded a lot of moments where you have that choice yeah and i think i Just, would add one yeah. thing to that which is that um some of the thinking about that that in between demographic and i think it's one that we've certainly talked quite a bit about is you know where do the the teenagers, the tweens, where, what do they want to do and where? And I think there's also the oppor plenty of these gathering space opportunities for allow them to go and socialize and hang out and not necessarily um, be, you know, focus on it being a play element. Like the, there's a playful nature to the gathering areas that have all the logs um, composed around them or even just the, the picnic areas and um, the opportunity to, to see, sit and hang out that um, allows for that social play. Um, that is a different way that um, that age group sometimes interacts. Yeah, I saw. I think I, I saw those. Just, just one little follow up question. I saw those areas as the the more, the gathering ones as potentially more appropriate as long as they're not being seen as that's where all the caregivers are going to hang out. You know, um, mm -hmm. if they're so adjacent to a younger kid play space. That's going to be where the moms and the dads and the nannies and, and whatnot um, are occupying, which will kind of drive them off a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the snowy owl, which yeah. is up on screen, I hadn't imagined as a tween to teen zone. Um, just a question about the, these overscaled animals to start. Like, are they occupiable? What are they made out of? And how many are there? Yeah. So the overscaled animals um, that are shown up in the top left hand side, those are the woodland friends. They are wood. Um, they're yeah. solid wood features. Uh, they're carvings. They're um, the contract, the equipment manufacturer out of Germany, Richter, is the one that is um, has an artist that will be creating these. Um, it's a series of kind of these elements that are placed within um, these nature trails. Um, and some of them will be climbable, some of them uh, may not and may be set into the plant bed and we're still working through that arrangement right now. And, and the owl? The owl itself is, sorry, that, that it's, it's a very different thing where the, the woodland friends in the top left hand side are more of a person scale. The owl itself is about eight meters in height. It's all wood. It's a wood structure. It's painted. Um, the, the, we've been working with this manufacturer um, on several uh, projects now, um, and they they do all the fabrication and installation themselves. Um, there are occupiable moments within the owl. You can, as uh, as we noted, there's kind of a theatrical stage on the front side at the base, but there's also an opportunity to, um, from an accessibility standpoint, to get into it. And then um, there are transfers that you can get up onto uh, platforms within. It is not solid. There's some transparency to it. Um, we're still working out with manufacturer what level of transparency will be. Uh, but one of the really cool things is you can get up into the eyes of the owl and have these views back out across the nature play area um, if you're a little kid. So that's really for little kids, not for teenagers. Um, I would imagine you're going to get adults up there too. And I don't think <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or for adults. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's the end of my questions. Okay. Can, can I just follow up with a question? It's Fadi here. Just oh, to okay. on conversation. Sorry, Paul, if you're out of order, it's just in no, the same. Well. Um, I'm just yeah. wondering again, uh, just maybe in relation to the, I know we're not talking about the destination playground 
today, but is this uh, is there an idea? Because I saw a render of a moose. Um, I think, if I'm correct, is there an idea? Is there a kind of like plan for these uh, oversized animals to sort of occupy at least the north side of the park and into the destination playground, or are those just two separate things? So I would just scrap that question that I comment that I might have later. Well, the, there is a narrative um, that we're pulling across um, the River Valley Park north and into the destination play with uh, potentially to be funded play equipment that, yes, there are um, nature inspired. They're, they're part of a family. They're not going to be a separate. That's correct. OK, yeah. OK. So my second question um, is about um, the management framework information and operations maintenance manual is there um i know that there was one meeting where we had the integration with dtah about road and road infrastructure stormwater I, my question is there is there a strategy that links uh stormwater infrastructure and runoff from roads um and like the jason villiers island development into this or because there was one map uh, where you showed the stormwater that enters into the Keating Channel on the north side and then kind of like run off along the edges of the park and into the uh, Canoe Cove. How does the system work with other stormwater on the site and uh, roads, Villiers Island, development buildings, anything like that? Is there is there a conversation happening between these things or no? Yeah, so um, we we are only bringing um, sidewalk water into the park um, yeah. for um, and, and then it goes through the whole, um, you know, uh, infiltration that we have through our planting soils and it eventually gets to the river. Um, but uh, we we aren't connected with the Villiers Island um, system. Um, all of that water is collected and it does go out into the, the Keating Channel. I mean, they have a whole nother system that um, that does go through infiltration and all of that. And I, I would want either Shannon or Herb to speak to that more than, than I. But um, we, we had at the very beginning um, looked at it, um, but the, it, it, the, the, the challenges that it brought in terms of bringing the, the kind of volumes that, that um, uh, we uh, would have, have needed it. It it just didn't it it didn't make sense for it to come through to the park. The park's water actually is able to um, to take its own water and infiltrate and um, and go directly out into the river because of the, the cleanliness of it mm -hmm. um, by um, uh, introducing that water into. Uh, the park, uh, we would have had to add a whole nother layer of infrastructure that was already going to be done in the um, in Villiers Island itself. So the road section itself where you, I see right now like one thick kind of line. Yeah. Um, so is that part of the road section that you're designing or is DTH designing or is this an integration project that will look at the two together? Just um, again, this is not. Um, this is just to better understand sure. where does the one system start and the other one end. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, is there any potential irrigation uh, from stormwater within the park with the vegetation, or is there no real need for it? Yeah. Um, so in terms of the kind of limit of works piece, um, the we are taking water from the right of way, so it's basically mm -hmm. back curb into the park because it doesn't have any of the oils or um, spray in, into that soil I mean, into that water um, in terms of collecting irrigation and water for irrigation we also looked at that as well we had a lot of challenges with being able to put cisterns there was an uh -huh. original idea of having cisterns in here so in the future um, maybe the water that's being collected um, with the developments could be um, sent through here. The problem is that we have a high water table. And sure. so the amount of cisterns and the, the kind of footprint that that took up um, started to eat away at um, the volumes that we had for the um, soil that we're trying to keep on site. And so it's one of those things where we had to make a hard decision that mm -hmm. uh, it made more sense to keep the um, contaminated soils on site rather than 
um, uh, gathering the water. Um, the, the irrigation system itself is a low, um, low water um, uh, irrigation system, and the idea is that, you know, over time, um, they won't need to use it for anything except for lawns. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Patty. Let's go back uh, to the list I have here. How about George next? Um, yes, I, I only have really one question, and it sort of relates to Betsy's um, um, opening commentary about, um, you know, sub demographics of, of children and young people. Um, I, I was not expecting your nature play area, so that whole thing came as a surprise to me today. Um, and and my question has to do with the relationship of that to the you know the 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 the, the planned um, destination play area that we're going to talk about later this afternoon. Um, I, are the do they appeal to the same demographic or demographics, or are they construed as addressing different constituencies from each other? And is there an answer to that question? Well, I think um, I think we're envisioning it as a, being a very different experience when you go to the nature play area versus the destination play area. Um, we've we've talked about a bit about this as being, and, and Emily kind of walked through that, you know, the the quality of moving through the park and the vegetation changing and these special moments of, you know, surprise and excitement when you move into a different area. The notion is as you're moving along River Valley Park North, you come to these clearings in the woods um, where ha that have these features embedded within them. Um, and it's it's maybe, you know, it may be wildly popular um, and have a, you know, a higher use than we anticipate, but um that they're kind of the scale is a bit different um when you get to promontory park south um that is envisioned as having a much higher demand um the, the equipment the um the amount of kind of pieces relative to surface area is going to be quite denser um and it will be quite exuberant um in a different way than i think we imagine these pieces being so mm -hmm. I think it does cater kind of to different interests and in what you're looking to get out of um, the play areas. Okay, George. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. For I'll come back with comments. Okay, uh, let's go, uh, Claude. I believe you're back now. Yes. No. Qu no question for me. No question. Okay, uh, Peter. It looks like Peter stepped away from the chat line. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. We'll come back to him then. Uh, Bridget, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, could you go to the very last image that you had, which was the sort of view looking back to the skyline of Toronto? That was the last slide or? Yeah, the very last slide. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, a really uh, impressive presentation. Um, my questions are really clarification. Um, first of all, the fire hall is not moving or it is moving. It, is it in the actual location that it is currently if I were to drive along commissioners? We have the, the fire hall has to be removed. It's currently within the right of way for the future light rail transit or BR. Oh, okay. So it's being moved south and interior to the park and we have to move it completely out of the current footprint um, of the existing building in order to um, to do foundation structural foundation work. OK, uh, and then um, the portion of park that is on the west side of the Don River, sort of uh, kind of north of your North River Park. Is that part of your scope of work or is somebody else or um, is it to come in the future? Um, yeah, so the, the area 
north of Commissioner Street Bridge and on the west side of the river. Um, that is within the limit of work of flood protection. Um, so we are constructing the flood protection uh, tableland, so the raising of the elevations of grading there, um, mm -hmm. and then providing um, a rough grade that's being surcharged for the future park. The future park is not funded um, with the, the flood protection project. I see. So the infrastructure for it is funded, but not the kind of uh, park on top. Just the earthwork infrastructure. Just the earthwork. Okay. Okay. And, then, and then my next question is the park to the south of that, which is part of the spillway. So south of the where uh, the river does its bend. Is that also part of like just clarifying the scope of work for that? Yeah, so um, the area that's above top of bank on the south side here against the spillway, and it's really on the, the west side of the southern spillway, um, anything above top of bank would be future parks. Um, we are providing an interim condition. We are stabilizing surfaces of that earthwork um, that's being delivered similar to what we're doing at the north. Okay, and then the north portion of Promontory Park is also being done by your firm? Um, Promontory Park North um, was part of the Cherry Street Lakeville project to create the edges of that Lakeville project. The um, surface, the finished grade is being left as a subgrade condition that's stabilized. Um, we're, uh, there's nobody currently scoped to do a, a park design there. I see. And then, I mean, your presentation was amazing with so much layered information, but what I didn't see was a section through River Park North and River Park South, um, where we actually understood low water and high water and the relationship, how much park and, you know, what, what that um, section actually looked like, because they're both River Park but they also have quite different qualities and characteristics. Um, so it's more like a question about. Yes, that, that is correct. Um, we did not have a section for that. What we had identified with the enlargement plans um, was to reference, I'll get back to one of the enlargement plans, apologize here. Um, where that top of bank is. So that is where we reviewed in the previous DRPs all of kind of the finishes right. mm -hmm. low. And that would be the limit of um, the regulatory flood event plus the half meter of freeboard that we need to allow above that elevation. And is there a similar one for the South, South uh, River Park? Yes. yes. Um, it should be picked up on this, but we don't have a overall um, okay i mean no you i mean there was so much in your presentation and it was really great but i just it's actually a critical piece because it's actually related to the whole reason that we're doing this in the first place and it actually gets to the very different nature or characteristics of the north side versus the south side so i thought it was kind of a critical drawing from my perspective but to see it on both sides of the river and to understand in effect the kind of high and low water in relation to, especially because you're actually addressing both sides of the river simultaneously, which is a really great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, you have other questions, Bridget, or are you okay? No, that's it, thank you. All right, great. Um, I don't see Peter back yet, so let's, uh, and Fatty's spoken, Nina Marie? Yes, thank you. Think uh, thank you very much uh, for an incredibly thoughtful presentation. Uh, lots of slides to go through. I have no further questions. Um, the issue with the, uh, the question about oversized family of animals uh, was made clear, as was the distinction between the nature play area and the soon to be discussed destination play area were questions that I had, but I think those are resolved for now. I have only comments for later. Thank okay. you. I'll come back to you for comments. Uh, Eric? Yes, I have a couple of questions, a few questions. Uh, one is on the, the, could you maybe go a little bit more in detail about the reason why you cannot have any planting on uh, the Les Planades? So like, what would, what is the condition that differs here versus uh, what we have on East Bay front that? Sure. Um, 
So, sorry, I'm just waiting for the section to come up because it's uh, easier to understand from that. Um, so the this the Cousins Key dock wall here is a really um, it's a very unique condition um, because it was built in two phases. Um, the first phase is the 1930s, uh, which is the relieving platform and the two dashed lines that you see um, below. Um, and I don't know if Herb, you can um, point that out with your pointer. Yeah. So that's that was the first um, uh, construction of it. Then in the 1960s, um, the dock wall was raised and new um, tiebacks were introduced that were part of the MT35 project as well. And so those tiebacks um, came in and um, uh, go all the way to that, yeah, that, that piece there. Um, and they're integrated into the MT35 piles. Um, the the issue is that 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 upper tie rod um, really holds the dock wall together. So um, in working with our marine engineers, they have given us limits in terms of how much we can excavate in this area without destabilizing the the um, the tie rods and the the dock wall. You can see that there's a a, a moment. Um, that we can get to that allows us to um, plant up to basically just the, that area where we have the um, the benches um, and that that's the kind of critical moment. Other than that, we we really can't go um, further to the west without disturbing the, the tie rods. And okay. it's not recommended. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, thank you. Another question is the light column that you have to commemorate the MT35. Are the column a? Are those the, the light? Are they made up with materials from the? Are they just brand new feature? Are they materials that are from the like you know reusing some of the materials from the MT35? They are. Um, they're new materials. It's more of an abstraction because the. Um, materials that were there have been um, uh, uh, demolished. They weren't able to be revealed to, to kept the, the, the white um, reveals along that facade. So yeah, these are um, just interpretations and um, they're more of an abstraction of, of, of the height and um, volume of the building. And are, are they off the shelf uh, feature or are they? Uh, uh, no. Yeah, these would be custom made. Um, the idea is that they are um, steel and uh, that they are large enough to have lighting within it and large enough also to be able to see from um, uh, across the, 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 the East Bay front. Mm -hmm. Okay, on, um, on page 88, uh, the uh, operation and maintenance facilities location, I see that there's, um, either some front end location or there are some full vision and maybe on trying to understand what those facilities are typically those are fairly utilitarian uh, facilities mm -hmm. um, just want to understand the what's the temporary nature versus the more permanent nature if you could elaborate a little bit more so for um for the, the, the temporary, um, well, I'll start with the permanent. <laughs> the idea is that the, there would be permanent um, uh, this associated with the sediment um, management area, and that that um, is an area that is really critical for maintenance of the, you know, the whole river system. And that's an area where it would be tucked away and um, could, uh, could be quite messy. Um, in terms of the temporary condition, um, we can't, have those um, that the permanent condition happen right away because of the Gardner Expressway project. Um, so we have been working with the Parks Department and with uh, Waterfront Toronto to identify some temporary areas um, which are highlighted here. Um, part of it is um, ownership and trying to um, negotiate where this could land, um, but in, it would be temporary in terms of um, uh, when the other facility gets up and running, which we do not know what that what that time frame is. Okay, 
those are all my questions. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, Jenna? Uh, are you there, Jenna, or, or no? Yes, I am. Sorry, I was uh, muted. Yeah. Um, thank you again for a, a really great presentation. Um, I just have one question. It's quite prosaic, and you might have mentioned it in your presentation. It just struck me when I was uh, seeing how many kids and people are going to be at the park and it's full build out. Um, are there going to be scattered uh, washroom kiosks or pavilions throughout or particularly in the areas in the in the play areas where there's going to be kids and skin knees and toilet training and things that need close facilities? Um, well, in terms of the um, Fire Hall 30 um, uh, building, which is slated to become a park um, facility, we are providing um, six new um, uh, washrooms in that location and have seen a real um, uh, kind of adjacency there in terms of how we've um, uh, opened up the edge of the playground in this area that people can really be able to spill out and and use the um, the uh, facility at, um, at the fire hall 30. Um, we really see this as a comfort station um, for the um, nature play yeah um, so that'll be um, day one um, in 2024 that that will be up and running. Um, that's that's the the only um, area for that um, feature. Um, then within the the destination playground, um, there is a pavilion that is also um, going to be a part of that that project, um, depending on funding. And the the idea is that there would be um, a washrooms in there that would be able to serve the um, destination play, as well as the rest of the park. Okay. Uh, is that okay, Jenna? You have any questions? No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. So, Pat, are you there? I'm not sure if Pat is still with us here. I think Pat may have departed. Okay. What about Peter? Is he? Uh... Yeah, I'm back. There he's I'm back. back. Hey, I stepped out for 15. Yeah, okay. Are you on, on questions or comments? We're on questions. I have no questions. OK, great. So that's everybody with questions. So uh, let's move to uh, comments. Uh, let's go down the list to keep it simple. Uh, Betsy. OK, I'm unmuting right away this time. Um, thanks again to the MBVA team. It's always such a thorough presentation. You almost give us too much to look at every time, especially since it's been many years and I've forgotten that two year um, to your time uh, where we first looked at that north side of the of the uh, river valley. Um, uh, I want to start with the MT35 foundation pieces. I think those are a really interesting way to uh, commemorate the building and the fact that they'll come up over and over again throughout the um, throughout the, the lawns and pathways and things like that I think is really interesting and so I I like that a lot, and I think if that's kind of married with this light flow idea, then it'll have some real coherence in um, how that uh, com commemoration starts to shine through. Um, I'd like to see more on the light poles. It seems like they're quite early in the design process now. Um, at first, when I was looking at the kind of demographic and the basis of that question, it, it, your presentation made the park seem really full. But when I kind of step back and look at it again, especially with the piece on the east side that turns the corner of the river, it's a huge park. So, I mean, having all of this play space that all seemingly is for kind of active younger children, notwithstanding that there are going to be some quiet areas for kids that don't really want to participate. It seemed like, well, like, wow, this seems like a lot of stuff for little kids and it's going to be kind of big and bold and with the larger animal figures that are kind of over in the north park are the, those competing with the which with what we know will be a, like a really overscaled destination playground piece. And it seemed like a lot of the same kind of treatment along that street edge, which is where it should be, frankly, in this project. Um, I think I've got a little hesitation about the balance of quiet and muted and just nature with 
the big activity. Maybe it's being triggered by the really big owl and the other really big animals that are going to kind of start popping up out of the park as you're looking um, from uh, from kind of the streetscape over into the landscape. But there will also be areas where you have these quiet vistas and just and won't see anything. And so it may, like I said, it may have been because the presentation is balanced to focus on the areas that I think maybe it's skewed a little bit that way right now. I'm not quite sure, but that's my only real hesitation in um, in the in the presentation is is it too much of the same kind of thing stressed, stressed all, all over um, the road and is it kind of for the same demographic? Um, I mean, I can't uh, really say and, and that criticism should be taken lightly because it's going to be a really amazing place. It's it's big and bold and will be very natural and welcomed by the community. Um, my last comment is actually on one more note on page um, uh, 59 of the presentation. It is the rendering view of the um, reclaimed beam that's being used as the balustrade for the overpass. The way that beam is installed um, in this little rendering view in the bottom right hand corner, if you could just move the screen over to that, instantly reminded me of that Michael Heiser rock at, the, at LACMA where they trucked this giant rock through the streets of Los Angeles at night and everyone went out and took pictures. And the big idea is that you have a rock suspending a void and that juxtaposition is really important. But in order to support, support the rock, the they rock. had to build these two little outrigger concrete pieces, one on each side that I thought completely undermined the project. And I, I'm, it's almost the exact same thing here where you have these two little um, concrete pieces that are overlapping the space of the beam. I think if you cut and the beam is almost seems like it's embedded in the earth, which is kind of the opposite of what the beam used to be doing. I would just kind of look at how that beam is being supported and if there's a way that you can kind of pull it up or have it slightly, slightly more, um, slightly less locked down, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that, that it reminded me of that project and um, it was the, kind of the, the one part of the project that I thought um, needs some more uh, attention relative to the design of, of the detail. Mm -hmm. That's okay, it. Thanks, uh, Betsy. Uh, thanks. George? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have two very minor observations and then one bigger one. And for the minor one, they're both kind of minor architectural issues, but I think they're both worth sort of paying a little bit of attention to. You had a rendering fairly early in the presentation. I'm sorry, I can't give you a page number. It was the rendering looking down at the atlas, looking down the path southwest toward the atlas crane. And, Oh, does somebody know the presentation well enough to be able to bring that up quickly? I know it was at the at the beginning, I think. Yeah, toward the beginning. Um, I don't think it was. It's, it's in this slide deck, Atlas Crane. Um, Emily, correct me no, if I'm wrong. Yes, it, well, it was in the presentation you just finished. Yeah, um, it was there somewhere. It's in the there's, back. An, there's an Atlas Crane um, perspective that that one. Yep. No, okay. this is one at ground level, not looking up. Yeah. Oh. Looking down the path toward the, the bottom the foot of the crane, it shows the drums. It was the one where he, where Emily was talking about the cake, the, the removing some um, of the cables and yes. so on. Yeah, it's I got the it. Axon. Um, yeah, got it. Page thirty-eight. Yeah. Yes, this one. Er, sorry, it's not a rendering. Excuse me. Huh. Okay, I I said already this is a minor point and it's an architectural one. But this fencing needs work. <laughs> it's too expedient. Um, and given how you know imaginative slash metaphorical you've been almost everywhere else, we got to do something about this fence. I, I'm not disputing that you need the fence. It's just that it's too pedestrian in the in the worst sense of the word. Um, so that's number one. And then the other one, I don't. We won't bother with the image for it. But the washrooms on the back of the fire hall in, in um, River Park North, they, they need to be carefully integrated architecturally into the rear facade of that building. 
and uh, the the plan just the, the way they were shown in diagrammatic plan made me think that that could be a um, a kind of you know in a worst case scenario that could be a sort of detailing disaster. And since they all face right out into the park, it's a facade that one want, wants to look composed and considered when you're done. So just those two little architectural issues. Um, um, I think need um, not major work, but need a bit of work. Um, my bigger point, um, it goes back to Betsy's original point, and then Nina Marie mentioned it as well, and, and Herb's reply to my question about the, the destination play area being anticipated to be much more intensively used and much more active and the nature play area that you've devised uh, for the middle of River Park North. Um, and I already mentioned that I was, um, I wasn't expecting the nature play area in River Park North, and I was quite pleased to see it. And in particular, I was pleased to see how you had and the, the various consultants that you seem already to be familiar with and, all, and have all established working relation, relationships with, the way in which you were able to, you know, devise all these, um, you know, ap, you know quasi-acrobatic apparatuses, but to do so with a material and formal palette that is so consistent with the rest of your design for the park. And I, I found that incredibly satisfying. Um, and so it then, so it leads, so that reaction on my part leads me back to the destination play, playground. And I didn't know quite how to read Fadi's remark about the moose that he saw at the end of the street. Um, but I saw that moose at the end of the street as well. And it worried me a little. Um, you know, I, I actually went to the, the 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 destination playground in Millennium Park with Chris Blasek on a field trip to Chicago, so I know it, and it's not that I'm against it, but its iconography is a little blatant and corny for my taste, <laughs> and I know playgrounds are often blatant and corny, but your nature play area is not blatant and corny. It's actually formally integrated with the rest of the design. And so I am um, accepting that the, the, the destination play area is going to be, you know, more active and more intense and larger in scale and denser with activity and apparatus than the nature play area. I'm hoping that a similar, um, uh, deft iconographic and formal integration into the language of the park as a whole will be achievable there because it will make the whole park so much more powerful uh, if it is like that, rather than it looking like some alien import that was brought in and put in one corner. Um, mm -hmm. That's my comment. And it may be as dressed as much to Waterfront Toronto as to Michael Van Valkenburg, but I mean, obviously, it's for me it's a big issue and it's worth uh, thinking about okay george uh thank you very much uh claude yes thank you i guess working remotely at mbva seems not an issue right you guys are producing <laughs> material it's amazing i also want to say great work from toronto waterfront i think you're following mbva <coughs> on there as a kind of a big machine producing coherent work and also to parks department. And I think when you look at the whole thing as an ensemble, you, you, you sense that they're all coming along and all the issues seems to be worked as you develop the design and things will not be left out. So I think it's great. We sense something gelling very well. For sure, MBBA is the Olmsted office of our era. Looking at the way that you have make it work with the city grid, the reshaping of the entrance works beautifully. 
the distribution of the program within those 27 acres, the scale of things, materiality. I love your circulation system with the bridge on the south roof and to avoid conflict like Homestead was, was did all in his park for bike, pedestrian, and all the kind of element of flowing. The whole system seems to flow very well and is connected. Management practice, thinking of shaping views when trees grow. Wow, this is great, right? We can't expect better than that. I have two minor little things. I think something is missing on the esplanade edge for me. I like the sheerness of being empty. I like the 10 meters with no trees. I just find there's something missing. I don't know what it is. The view of there of the of the downtown is fantastic, right? The kind of a contrast between nature and culture is right perfect. So maybe this is where the foundation of the building of uh, M35 for me, it's too timid. And I think your beam that are marching, which I understand your your intent, I think they need to be beefed up some, somehow. 40 centimeter dimension beam outside there would look like nothing, seven meters tall. So I think there's something there I think could be singular, strong, bold, heritage, that could work within what you've done would be just inserted and create something there. I, that's right. The lighting seems to be. I hear it. I understand where where I, I can see you're at the beginning of that. But I think there's an amazing opportunity here to really create something unique that makes reference to the heritage, but also embrace this phenomenal view. So that's that's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Claude. Um, Peter. Right. So um, I don't have very much to say. I've I've got two uh, minor points. Um, I, I'm I'm a little worried about the lighting standard. Um, it seems a bit um, institutional, uh, and also the height of the pedestrian lamps uh, seems um, unnecessarily high. Uh, changing the scale from pedestrian intimacy to um, almost road light heights. I, uh, uh, I know I know a bit about lighting and uh, I know that the higher it is, the less money you pay because you can have a more powerful lamp and less lamp, lamp standards. But if we can borrow a little money from somewhere else and introduce pedestrian lighting that's uh, lower down and more intimate in scale. Uh, my second concern was, and this may be a rainforest driven concern, um, the, some of the seating that's um, logs and so on, they're right on the ground. A uh, uh, little worried about um, about rot <laughs> uh, and and therefore maintenance coming up in the future. I, uh, I I saw some details there that just wouldn't fly at this end of the country. Uh, and so just for consideration, uh, remember that wood deteriorates when it's when it's in contact with the ground and. Uh, for higher level comments, I, um, uh, I, I disagree with the comments about uh, George's comments about the scale of the play areas um, uh, and the uh, intensity of them. Uh, I'm thinking uh, that there are many, many opportunities, the Leslie Spit and all the other things that are in the area for um, less intensive play and, uh, and, and strolls and walks in nature and so on. and. Uh, I, I think that there is a place for uh, an intensive play area, and it's here. It's close to where people are going to live. It's quite accessible. And um, whilst memories of taking my children to the park are receding, <laughs> I do have five grandchildren, and uh, and they love that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, there's a big bird down on the waterfront in Vancouver that they just want to see every time we go for a walk. And uh, so whilst it might look corny to some, um, uh, to, uh, to a two, three, four, five-year-olds, they're, they're pretty amazing things and they're, they stuck in their memory. So I wouldn't be as critical with the design um, of those things, uh, but take, take it all in balance. Um, 
uh, the, these comments are meant to to guide. Um, and then, of course, I, I like like Claude. I, I, what an unbelievable presentation, and how magic this place is going to be. It's uh, world class. It's a much overused expression, but this this is truly going to be world class. I'm very very impressed. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Bridget. Uh, again, thank you for a really exemplary presentation. A um, few comments. Um, can we go to the very last image again? The kind of uh, view with the skyline in the distance. <clears throat> um, I guess one thing is I thought that the um, I appreciated the kind of uh, MT35 building, and I guess I felt that the light columns looked too slick and that the building itself, the existing building was actually much grittier and maybe it needs to sort of express the slightly rough around the edges quality of that uh, existing building without mimicking or replicating it in any way. Um, uh, I really appreciated your kind of interpretation of a constructed nature by the promontory walls and the use of the kind of striations of different kinds of rock almost create a kind of sedimentary condition. And I felt that was a very strong aspect of the project. Um, and um, I also appreciated uh, for me much more clarity of the line between the park, Riverside North and commissioners, because we've actually seen other presentations related to the public realm of commissioners. And it was always a little bit fuzzy for me what how you made the transition from this kind of urban street with transit into the park. So I feel that um, it's actually a very important edge within your kind of bigger park. And I feel that the coordination between the other consultants and your, your team needs to be really carefully orchestrated so that we really get a kind of strong relationship between all of the kind of East-West commissioner's work as well as the kind of um, threshold and entry points to the park. And I know, so I guess in your presentation, we were seeing it from the park side and we kind of saw it from the other side, but I feel like um, the kind of um, real uh, control of that, I think should really come from your firm and the ability to make sure that each of those thresholds and entry points are really as strong as possible using the signage and the garbage cans and the benches and all those tools and the vocabulary that you've established in the park. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think that um, one of the things I particularly like about your whole project is the combination of ordinariness and specificity. So you can kind of use things like uh, uh, park benches, which are pretty ordinary, and then combine that with things that are much more specific. And I feel that that is really a kind of um, quite masterful way of addressing the overall project. Um, I also really appreciate the fact that you can build on all of the things that you learned from working with the Parks Department for Corktown Common and actually kind of not, uh, and use that as a platform to do an even better job with the operations and maintenance. And I think that for me, if it can set, be an amazing park, but it can also set a whole new standard for operation and maintenance within the park system, it'll be amazing, remarkable. Uh, um, I guess I felt that this, again, the way that you describe, you didn't actually describe the fact that the north side of Riverside Park was almost a Belvedere or a kind of urban apron extending into this uh, river zone and then kind of descending down into a more natural condition. And that the south side was really a more natural, um, not natural, uh, looking park, uh, even though they were all constructed. And I guess this kind of issue of the both sides and how they form in effect a new river is something that I feel is an essential part of the narrative that is actually already there, but I feel needs to be kind of maybe expressed right at the outset. Um, and then maybe my last point is that um, the role of public art is one of the signatures of Waterfront Toronto really established by some pretty um, great selection of and curation, uh, especially along Front Street and other parts of Waterfront Toronto. And I guess I feel that we're looking at maybe of all of the pieces, one of the early stages. And um, I think that the careful uh, continued work with the Waterfront Toronto public art 
people is kind of a really important part to kind of create these other moments and other scales within the overall project. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Bridget. Uh, Fatty? Mm -hmm. Um, yep, I also really want to echo everyone's sentiments about how incredible this is and in some ways how fortunate we are as a city and as a province and as a region to have to have this happening. And now that we're getting closer and closer to it, the more exciting and, um, you know, blessed. I actually really feel that we have this incredible team working on it. Uh, so I just want to really put that up front and say, you know, this is a, a great and incredible um, you know, moment for our city. And I just want to really thank you for all this awesome work. Um, well, a couple of comments that I had is around, I, I'm actually really happy that we don't necessarily get to get a double row of tree on the harbor promenade looking south, especially in juxtaposition to what will be a really heavily vegetated and naturalized edge um, and river park all along um, the site. So in some ways, this sort of very civic urban plaza like promenade on that uh, east on the west side of the of of, of Promontory Park uh, will be really um, incredible. I think maybe to to echo what Claude was saying, perhaps there's something in the paving. I think the current rendering shows a very sort of typical uh, paver that might you know um, just kind of give it a kind of anonymousness. So some something to be a bit more inventive about, if if at all possible, to maybe. Uh, bring in another variation of a pattern that might be uh, used in other parts of uh, the waterfront could be one way to think about it. The other thing, um, I, I maybe George, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you were against this idea of an active play zone on the north side of the park. I think the reference to a more uh, absent a clearer strategy of where these sort of oversized animals will be uh, is a little hard for me to comment in the sense of um, you know, not knowing exactly where these oversized large <laughs> play structures will be within the park. So, you know, I really, really appreciate and like the references to the sort of geologic, um, maybe even industrial references that you're bringing in as a play layer, like the Badlands scrambles and others. And I'm wondering, and I'm wondering if there's an there's opportunity outside, outside of the promontory park. Uh, oh, sorry, the destination playground, playground that maybe play maybe itself is integrated, integrated into, into more of the um, structures, structures like the walls, like the walls or, or even having more kind of references towards things like, you know, vegetation or trees or other things that kids can climb on versus an animal per se. Um, and again, this is just me making a comment absent, absent a larger understanding of where these things will be. Um, the last uh, comment I want to say is about how incredible uh, the kind of uh, uh, operation management thing that you think for this project is really um, going to be an incredible resource for the city and for maybe other places to also utilize and learn from. And I think this is what makes this project super robust and really wonderful. Um, and in that spirit, again, I'm, I, I want to echo Bridget and say, that threshold between what is happening on the streets, especially commissioners, is is should be. I feel like in your leaderships, uh, in 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 your purview uh, and in your leadership as a design, as a design. Specifically, specifically around things like you know where do you start making views from from for street trees? Where does the stormwater, even infiltration, sewer mains, whatever else that might integrate into the road infrastructure itself, and how that meets the edge of the the north side of the park, um, uh, Riverside Park Center is going to be really critical. So um, I would just want to re-emphasize um, that relationship as both an infrastructural one and an experiential one that should be not left uh, to the last minute and maybe should be in your hands. But uh, overall, amazing. Uh, so congratulations. OK, thanks, Fatty. Uh, Nina Marie. Yes, thank you very much again. Uh, loud and uh, logging echoes of what my colleagues have said, but in particular also uh, sincere recognition of this team as clearly one of the best possible teams positioned to deliver a project of this size and complexity at the time you're delivering it. Um, we really have seen a turn and a pivot in the way we understand our public landscapes, particularly as 
the more naturalized world disappears out from under us. This is an opportunity not only for rediscovering it, but recreating it at a time that allows us to build resilience and to build partnerships with the organizations that will oversee and implement. And you've really set that up for us. Um, of course, that doesn't happen without an active uh, client. And again, my Nina Marie, you're breaking water. up. Do you want to turn your video off or? Uh... I don't have my video on, oh, okay. but I am in a very windy spot about um, on the lake. So hopefully you can hear me and I'll type them if you can't. I would say most importantly that I'll try to be quick. I especially appreciate the gradient, uh, the legibility of the gradient of programming from north to south and west to east that is from more to less active. The ecotype analogs you've given are extremely helpful, uh, not only for a picture and an, a sense of the landscape experience that will happen, but also let's remember references for interpretation in the early days of this park where people may not know what that forest frame is because the legibility has is yet to come. You really provided for that us for that with these ecotype analogs and I hope that this imagery will be picked up in some kind of really strongly curated opportunity uh, for interpretation by the city of Toronto and by our you know, the city partnership that has to take over this operation. And just like the operations manual, which is very sophisticated and really a step forward in world class contemporary parks planning, you're giving us a piece of an opportunity for partnership for monitoring this um, succession plan. So this is really designing and building an ecosystem here, and you guys are known for your legibility of your planting designs, the thoroughness of the research. And this doesn't work without, as you've noted, without kind of directive, responsive, adaptive management. And the manual that you will develop for parks operations is not just the curation and direction of that responsiveness, but also the management of human activities. So the two of these happening together are, offer tremendous opportunities for monitoring, some of which will inevitably be done in tandem with um, our local universities for what a kind of urban ecology and the health benefits of nature will look like. So this, I can't emphasize enough in my comments how important that piece is on handoff. Um, just to turn to something a bit more specific, I completed uh, the, the discussion about nature play. Uh, first of all, you, it's critically important. I appreciate so much your rigorous research in connecting, to connecting the naturalistic biodiversity with human health and well-being through active play. There isn't research that says this is only for kids and toddlers. It's actually really important. You're seeing now in the development of youth leadership in exploration, self-exploration in a less didactic and directive way. And you know whether or not these animals that are oversized are a part of a larger story, whether they're you know visible or a little bit hidden. I think the point is that these nature play areas are distinct from the destination play in, in a lot of different ways. And we, we might just say for now that the destination play will be actively curated. The nature play is much more passively explored, even though there are these very obvious opportunities for activation. They lend themselves uh, to the kind of development of youth at a variety of different age levels. And I hope that we'll uh, be able to follow that along um, as it is implemented. Really, I just want to congratulate you and say thank you for taking note of these compliments as they're meant to, to emphasize the strongest points of an already terrific project. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's move to Eric. Eric, are you thank there? You. Yes, I uh, just unmuted myself. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, a, a great work. I think this is, um, again, to the whole team, to everyone that's involved. It's very, I found it very inspiring. It's a play, it, it's serious and it's fun at the same time. Uh, it has some whimsical element and it has some, it's very well structured. I found it has a really good balance um, with, you know, the planting, the soft, the hard, where program, the functions are located. I think that it fills something here that like, Toronto really needs. It's something that is quite unique. <laughs> 
And I think we're going to be proud of this place. I think it's again, thank you for doing, you know, to actually creating something here that is uh, that that I think will uh, will inspire all uh, Torontonian to to come to the to the waterfront. It's quite uh, it's quite wonderful. There is a so the, the comments I'm going to be providing here are you know really more about at the detail level. I think from organization structure. It's all great. Um, it works very well. Uh, in terms of um, one of the person who was asking at the last session about the uh, the event diagram, how that's going to work. Uh, thank you very much for providing this because I think it actually does uh, does provide me the comfort that yes, this is actually moving in the right direction, and even areas there at, on the at in the, where the events are happening is actually going to work uh, quite well. The um, I'm with uh, on. The, on the Les Planades, uh, I, f I understand why you can't plant trees. Uh, that's fine. I do find though that is maybe, you know, maybe it's it, it, it needs a little bit more. Uh, maybe there are some, I'm just thinking like in the middle of the summer when the sun is beaming there, whether there needs to be some element for protection or there's some, you know, not over the entire things, but are they a few, uh, a specific moment that can happen there on the surface that maybe allows for some uh, a little bit of a, of a relief um, for there. I found the uh, also on the on the design. I think we mentioned about the M thirty five. I think that um, I think it's a good placeholder at this point. I think I think it probably needs to be pushed a little bit further in terms of the commemoration of the uh, of the heritage. That maybe the, I think the lighting system, and you've mentioned that when you've answered the question. I think that they will be. Uh, I think those will need to be very carefully designed, and I think they can be pushed further. Uh, and whether then it can be other elements that are integrated, whether it's on the Lesplanade or it's on these light fixture, or it's as part of the base that can continue to evolve. I just think that it needs to probably be, be another level of added richness in um, in that area that could be that can help with that uh, uh, to create a meaningful uh, commemoration. The uh, on the fire hall, um, and that was mentioned by by um, by George. Uh, I, I found that I, I like the idea that in the future there will there's a potential to integrate, you know, a cafe, some active uses, and all that. I found that the location to the south of the of uh, especially on the the south uh, toward the east of that building, having those washroom in such a prominent location when you know it's probably one of the prime view it's south location if there were some cafe or other activities i found that maybe the program within the fire hall could be better structured to just look in the long term what are going to be the uses in this on this place which side which edge do they would they benefit from being on and i think that could help to uh, to better uh, better plan the interior structure of the uh, of the fire hall um there was a mention about the bridge detail. You have a couple. I I kind of agree that you know those are beautiful beam, beautiful structure. Um, you have an example on page 19 and on page 60 of your presentation. Both of them I think are slightly awkward in terms of one has on nine, page 19 has a handrail in the inside. I don't know if that's just a previous uh, a previous. Uh, design uh, or elaboration of the design uh, but i think that as it was mentioned by um i believe it was by betsy i agree like i think these these can probably be uh, read more um respect respect more the nature of those uh, of the uh, of these beams um i think there is a i like some of your i like your rationale you have with regard to fencing uh, there's a, but I'm more just wondering if you could uh, simplify your some of your fencing palette. Uh, there is some uh, some I think they are generally quite good. I think that the double pipe, the plant rail that you see on page 76, seems to be a little bit out of place with regard to the palette that you have, which has some fairly natural uh, uh, natural 
element and some simplicity to it. This one seems to be quite different. So maybe in the future, in the, the next round of, of exploring whether the, that family of, of fencing, whether there could be a uh, some some continuity and some uh, material that uh, are continuous from one to the other. Um, has mentioned by I believe it was by Peter. I think your the lighting the lighting doesn't really fit currently in the family of the furniture and your fence, or it seems to be an afterthought. Um, so that's the thing that I agree that you know if you can put pedestrian lighting, if it could be something, it doesn't have to be complicated, but this is very utilitarian. It doesn't need to really be part of what you uh, of of your of your palette. So something that I would encourage to uh, to continue to to look further at. Um, on page eighty two, on your is the paving materials. The one thing that I like and I, the way I read it, and I don't know if I'm correct, but there's a lot of asphalt pavement, um, and then whether it's they are opportunities to, to have, to, to, to actually look at other alternative. It seems that there's a. Uh, I understand the high usage, the the need for accessibility, but whether they are some of those asphalt path that maybe can actually have a maybe a more natural materials or something different from a palette perspective that is more, I would say, a more noble or more natural type of uh, of materials. And finally, my last comment, which is really about like part of my question on the operation and maintenance facilities. Um, I would say I think in the long term where they seem where they're, you're putting them seems to be making a lot of, 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 of it's, it seems very appropriate in the short term in the front end of my you know this could be there for looks like it's maybe a four year period from now going forward but my experience is these can actually be there for a really long time before it's ready to move and sometimes they tend not to disappear so i would say that if you can put them in a place that is the least visible the least uh in people's way uh that's i would say that's it's one of the key criteria to um, to select select a temporary location in a place where basically nobody's going to notice it thank you Okay, Eric, uh, Jana. Is Jana still there? It's, oh, I think uh, Jana, Jana had to go. She and stepped she left up. Yeah, she left about, us uh, with, with the uh, message. She left your message. Is Pat still there? Leon, do you know if she had to step out too, or? I, I don't know. Maybe, yeah, maybe Pat also had to step out. Okay. Okay, I think that completes our list. Boy, a uh, lot of comments here. I'm going to do my best to try and summarize everything, but I'm going to start with uh, several adjectives that people have used in this. We all appreciate the unbelievable level of detail in the presentation and the phenomenal work that's been done uh, to make this a stunning place. I, I think what every time I see this, I get more and more excited and I constantly realize this is like actually four years to opening uh, that we're all going to hopefully be able to see, feel, touch and walk this. So it, it's just very inspiring all the way around. I'm, I'm going to group the comments, I think, into some sort of larger there really are, are, are no major, major issues here, but they're sort of larger items and then many, many details and suggested refinements for consideration. In no particular order, I'm gonna start with uh, the Esplanade, the treatment for the Esplanade uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because um, it is the place where, as I think Claude said, we have the most stunning views of the downtown core and it'll be even more uh, powerful and unique in the future. Several comments were made um, about uh, that there was something missing in the Esplanade, that perhaps uh, it needed uh, a unique treatment. It, it needed a stronger uh, reference to, to how to commemorate MT-35. Uh, 
uh, was one suggestion. Another one I believe was in terms of perhaps different, um, uh, you know, paving materials, different ground cover materials. Everybody I think understands why there can't be uh, planting or vegetation there because of the tiebacks. But um, that's an area where many people identified that there's still something that that could be done there to make that make that stronger. Uh, so that's the first major area. Uh, in terms of uh, some interesting comments uh, related to demographics and uh, about you know is 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 the balance of natural versus active areas right? Uh, is there too much emphasis perhaps on the active? And then a, another uh, related comment about the natural versus the destination playground. And uh, you know I know the details of the destination playground are, are still yet to come. But um, I think to be fair, there is a difference of opinion among several people that said, Maybe that's all okay. Um, it is such a big area. There's room for all, and um, you know, uh, little kids obviously will uh, be gra gravitate to uh, whether it's large animals or whatever it is. If that's part of the feature of the destination playground, that's still okay compared to um, the active areas that are provided in the natural playground. I have to say, when I looked at this myself as as a senior citizen. Uh, I want to play in the natural playground, and I think I would be equally fascinated going to the destination playground. So I think uh, we'll see how that evolves uh, in, in the next steps. And another area I, I think that is really, really important, and it's often left out, is the manual, learning from the Corktown Common experience, about the operation and maintenance manual. We've, we've commented so many times in the panel that, you know, great things are built, they're not maintained, and over time, they really are deteriorating, and they look in very bad shape. And the the constant need for uh, that maintenance uh, and having that documented in such a detailed way, I think, is a really, really important positive step, not only for Waterfront Toronto, obviously, but for the Parks Department and and for all of us so this is some of the sort of bigger things that i think are, are critical many many details i won't take the time to go through every one but i think there's some that are important one is uh, several commentary about the light poles uh, uh one uh, that, that they feel too high uh you know really important to get them at, at more of a pedestrian level um another uh comment about the proposed uh, light poles that are to be erected in the foundations of in the foundational areas of MT35. The more details, people want to see more detail on that. Um, perhaps a stronger reference to the sort of rougher industrial heritage that that was there might be a suggestion, but I think that's an area where more detail is, is needed. In terms of other specific comments, um, I'll just pick a few here. Um, the the uh, suggestion uh, about how the beam is treated on the bicycle bridge and how that's supported, some refinements, some modification of there, uh, I think is in order. Uh, commentary about uh, the fencing, the fencing treatment around the Atlas crane structure uh, needs a bit of work. Uh, the facade of the washrooms need to be handled very sensitively in terms of the architectural detail because uh, they're going to be very exposed. The um, Comment about the uh, I think people generally like the idea of using uh, the logs and, and and wood and timber, uh, but a, a comment which is only too true in terms of the log seeding uh, over time uh, when these logs are exposed they do rot and so there's an issue again in the maintenance and maybe that's covered off in the operational maintenance manual I'm not sure. Um, a uh, couple of other things here in terms of don't forget uh, the importance of the potential of public art uh, in this and um, the commentary uh, about the, uh, I guess uh, the phrase was the narrative of how the north south and south sides of the river come together. That's an important story to tell and it's important to link those two sides uh, in, in, the, in the, the evolution of, uh, of this project. And I think maybe the final general area that I heard was how 
we can all be so proud of this. This looks like this is going to be, this is really going to put Toronto on the map. This is unique, and this is showing existing and future generations how to address ecology and how to uh, have a strong interpretation of, of bringing back what was there and uh, the power of recreating and, and uh, resilience for the future of the city. So again, I just can't um, speak highly enough about this. I've always been excited by this. This was one of the first ideas. I remember about 30 years ago when David Crombie and I uh, were talking in the city about the potential of bringing this river down into the harbor as in a natural way. And uh, I, every time I look at this, I got to pinch myself and say, this is actually going to happen. And it's only four years away. So I hope that captures most of the, the comments. There are many, many details, and I'm sure they'll be picked up in the minutes. So I just want to end and again, thank thank you very much for a stunning presentation. And uh, uh, we'll give you an opportunity to respond to the comments that you've heard in my summary and from the individual panel members. So uh, Herb, I, perhaps maybe you want to do that response? Yeah, sure, sure. I'll lead and Emily can join in. I mean, I'd, first of all, thank you all for the comments. Um, I think um, one, we appreciate all of the feedback that we've had over the many uh, design review panel presentations that we've had to date. It's um, been incredibly helpful in shaping um, the advancement of the design as we progressed. And I believe that, you know, I, I speak for the entire MBVA team that the, the items that you all have flagged, there are still areas that we personally feel strongly need further advancement and we're, we're pursuing them and continuing to, um, they're evolving. So I think you're right on target with those and there's no surprises there. Um, but uh, Emily, I don't know if you wanna add. Sorry, yeah, I would just reiterate that you guys um, drilled in on the, the parts that we know we need to work on too. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, but thank you so much for all the comments. It's been uh, very helpful to get the feedback. Okay, you're more than welcome. So uh, we need to take a vote of the panel and I would propose a vote of uh, full support. Any disagreement? Seconded by Peter. Yeah, oh. agree here. Okay. Agree. Yep. Is it unanimous? Yeah, agree. Like yes. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Herb and Emily. And uh, Thank you. I guess we're a little over time. It's 25 to 4. Do you want to take a... A 10 minute break, is that all right? Yeah, or five or 10, yeah, whatever people want. About, uh, you want to come back at uh, quarter two? Sure, yeah, good. sounds good. Okay, quarter to four Eastern time, Peter.